Greg Primo, the Chief of Police here in University Place, and I'll introduce my co-facilitator. That'll be our Public Safety Administrator, Jennifer Hales. So she's going to be the one that's monitoring all your chat stuff. So if you have questions and stuff, that'll go through Jennifer, and she'll pass those on to our presenters tonight. Um, just a couple of reminders uh, for the presentation time. Remember to go ahead and keep your computer muted. Uh, so turn your microphones off um, and turn your cameras off so that there isn't any kind of distractions in the corner. Um, if you can just do that through the whole presentation, that'd be great. Again, if you're going to ask questions, you can just do that through the chat function. So just type your questions in there um, and we'll get those passed on. Um, and then just another little warning. I know Jennifer sent out uh, an email earlier today um, or was yesterday that gave a little bit of a heads up in regards to um, some of the images. There's some videos in this presentation that some people might find a little disturbing or something. So it's just a heads up that the videos tend to be about some real live incidents and stuff. So if that might bother you or somebody that's in the house with you watching, um, you know, you just turn they're very short videos, so you could just turn your uh, monitors off or, or just look away for a few minutes or a few seconds, really. Um, so just that little heads up. Again, just a reminder to turn your cameras off on your computer. Um, that'll help everybody. Um, let's see, any other things? Oh, I think the other question or thing we were asking is if you if you registered and you said in your registration that there was somebody else that was going to be with you, whether it was a spouse or somebody, um, that's, if you have additional people uh, that are watching with you, uh, send Jennifer an email. Uh, we're trying to get a good kind of class attendance size uh, idea of how many people. Just send an email. So if you have additional family members that are watching with you, if you could just shoot us an email at some point, letting us know, I think that'll be nice to have uh, that kind of data with us. So I'm going to jump right into tonight's uh, presentation introduction here of our first or our presenter tonight. Um, that's Sergeant Jason Youngman. He is our lead DT defensive tactics instructor for the department and also a certified master instructor by the state criminal justice training commission. So he works with uh, you know developing all the curriculum and training for our department. There's a team of instructors and he has a partner here with him tonight that they utilize and, and go through as a team to, to give this instruction to all the deputies uh, within the department each year. And he'll talk a lot about that training and and all the legal things that are around uh, police use of force. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start to turn it over to Jason and go ahead and get this uh, presentation started. So. and I'm sharing. Oh, we're good to go. OK, good evening, everybody. Uh, I am Jason Youngman, Sergeant with the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, uh, currently assigned to Graveyard. Uh, like Chief said, I'm the lead defensive tactics instructor for the department currently, and then also certified as a master instructor to the state of Washington Criminal Justice Training Commission. I have uh, Deputy Casey McKeithen, who you'll see in a bit here with me. He's also a state certified master instructor through the uh, Criminal Justice Training Commission. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. This will be my sixth time uh, presenting at a community academy. Uh, it's one of the one of my favorite things to present at. It's one of my favorite classes that we get to teach. Usually we get to be in person and I get to see you and hear you and field your questions. And I move around the room and talk with my hands a lot and it's kind of annoying and you have to follow me. But today I'll try to pretend that you know the camera is you and we'll do that. Um, these, are, these are a great way for us to get to know you as community members and for you to get to know who we are and what we do uh, in police work. Uh, use of force, you see it a lot. You see it a lot, especially in the media right now. Uh, it looks pretty simple when you watch a, a short video clip, but those are always complex uh, situations with a lot going on, and there's a lot to look at when we talk about a use of force incident. Um, these are usually high stress, uh, high speed incidents where officers are making decisions in split second time frames. 
um, and then get second guess for a long time after that. Uh, so there's an area where we put a lot of training and a lot of focus in to make sure we're doing it right. And overall, as a department and as a, as a, uh, uh, a profession, we do a good job. Uh, one of the things we don't do a great job at is explaining why we do what we do. And that's part of what these types of uh, presentations and community involvement can help us do is to help you understand you know, why we, we do some of the things we do and why we make some of the decisions we have to make. So uh, as, you, as we go through this, if you have questions, I love it. So feel free to uh, put them in the chat there and I'll try to field those as we can. If something comes up and it's something I have for later down the line, uh, I'll, I might just say, hold on to that for a minute. We'll come back to it, but I'll try to always circle back and get as many of those as we can. So, so some of the topics we're going to cover, we're going to talk about some of the dangers facing law enforcement. We're going to look at some actual numbers from some FBI statistics and some Bureau of Justice statistics. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the use of force laws uh, that govern what we're allowed to do and what we do in police work and then some specific uh, policy that is specific to the department itself. We'll talk a little about what the training that deputies go through to uh, become a police officer when it comes to use of force and how they uh, continue their training throughout their career. We'll look at some of the force options that are available to them. And then we actually have some of the tools of the trade with us today that we'll demo. Uh, we're gonna demo a, a baton. Uh, we're gonna show you what OC spray looks like, but we're not gonna demo any of that. Couldn't get a volunteer for that. Uh, we're gonna demo a, a vascular neck restraint. We'll show you, let's see what else do we have. Uh, we're going to show you uh, what a taser looks like and actually we'll fire a live cartridge from that. So you'll get to see and hear what that looks like. We'll fire it into a uh, conductive target that Casey's going to hold up in front of himself. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, deadly force incidents and where that threshold is and how that how we get there and what happens in those, how they're investigated. Um, we'll talk about excessive force, uh, how what that is, how it's governed, um, the duty to intervene and how officers intervene when something like that happens and what happens uh, in, in the follow-up if something like that happens. And then we'll have a little piece at the end talking about vascular neck restraints because that's a pretty popular topic right now. So we'll make sure everybody understands what those are. So first slide here, we're going to look at some numbers. Now these are from the law enforcement officers killed and assaulted summaries that the FBI puts out every year. These are usually behind by about a year and a half or so. So what you're going to look at here are 2018 numbers. Uh, the 2019 numbers just became available, so we'll be working on updating those uh, now that they're available. Um, and these numbers uh, are not always 100% accurate because not every agency reports their numbers to the FBI Unified Crime Report, but they're uh, a good Million. Hold on just a sec. Um, okay, we're holding for a second. Um, it's okay, it's back, I guess. I, we it, just, it just lost, lost connection. For a second. Are we good? Okay. okay. All right, so approximate population, a little over 320 million. Uh, according to the FBI UCR, there was 1.2 million violent crimes uh, in 2018. So that actually took a dip from the, the year before. It was down just a little bit, so that is good news. Uh, law enforcement duty deaths in 2018, we had 166. Uh, 1,513 law enforcement line of duty deaths in the last 10 year period. That's yeah. an average of about 151 a year. That average has remained the same for the last several years. About 36% of those, and that number fluctuates. Just a sec, sorry. So we have no audio. Jen, in the right corner of your team's window, click your um <clears throat> right jen right. those instructions that i just sent you those were just for you um specifically okay i can't see Let's see everyone's saying that they they can hear it fine and can see greg should stop sharing and reshare the powerpoint is not working jen in the top right corner of your teams when you'll click your picture can, choose settings i just jen you don't have to read those ones out loud can everybody see the um See the video now. I just swapped the video out, so you should be able to see the presenter. I see the slide. Yep. Now the slideshows. OK, sorry, Greg, I just kicked you off again. Um, go ahead and restart the share the slideshow again.
Is everybody able to see that, the slideshow? Go ahead and type a yes into the chat. I love the yeses. Keep them coming. <laughs> Perfect. All right, well, unless I'm hearing any no's, I would say go ahead and continue. Is it? Okay, we're back. All right. This is, this is 2020. This is how we do it. This is, this is COVID, <laughs> we right? We just get through it, right? We roll through it. We wait till January 1. Okay. Uh, so about 36% of those uh, were felonious. You know, that number will, will bounce around a little bit. It's usually about a third uh, of those officers are feloniously killed, meaning murdered. Um, you'll have other line of duty deaths that come from vehicle collisions. Officers may have a heart attack or a stroke while they're on duty, something like that. Um, there are several in the last couple of years that were really related to um, some some results of the 9-11 the attacks. So there's other other ways that officers can can be harmed in this job. But 36 percent, uh, 551 officers in total uh, murdered from 2009 to 2018. So uh, that's just some of the idea of some of the threats we face when it comes to uh, dying in the line of duty. Um, here's an example uh, on this video of one of the assaults on officers that might happen during that time period. Can you play that, Chief? Shot fired, Kate. Shot fired. I'm hit. So that's an incident uh, from Florida in 2011. Uh, just to give you an idea of how fast things can go from what, what seems like a, uh, a routine traffic stop uh, to something really bad, which is why we don't like to say the word routine, because uh, nothing's ever routine. Uh, in this incident, that was a, a passenger, a male passenger with his girlfriend driving, and as the officer went around to that side, a gun was immediately produced, and he shot him three times. The officer survived. He took two rounds. Uh, into the vest and then one that slipped right under his vest and hit him in the abdomen. Uh, but he did survive those those rounds, fortunately, um, and and was able to get up and, and get on the radio. They later uh, caught that young man uh, down the road when he drove. He actually jumped into the, the driver's seat on top of his girlfriend's lap, hit the gas and drove off in the car. They caught him later when he ran the car into a, a house. So um, not, not maybe the best driver or brightest, but they got him. So uh, he was sentenced to uh, life in prison in Florida. Uh, in Florida, they have a mandatory sentence for uh, assault. Or if you try to murder an officer, it's mandatory life sentence. Um, and he's actually uh, back in court now uh, making an appeal, trying to say that he didn't know it was an officer because he was having a seizure or something. So we'll see where that goes. Um, so moving forward, now we'll look at just assaults, kind of like the video you just saw. That what that ended, and not ended up being a homicide, but that would go into our stats as an assault on an officer. Uh, in 2018, we had 58,866 uh, police officers assaulted. That number was actually down uh, by about 1,300 uh, from 2017, which was good. That was the first year in about the last five years where we saw a drop in overall assaults. Um, unfortunately, the numbers from 19 and 20 will not be down. Uh, those, those have gone up. So when we get those numbers and plug them in, I think we're going we're to see the rise that we had before. So uh, a little over 18,000 of those were hospitalized or injured. Over 2,000 assaulted with firearms, 1,100 plus assaulted with knives or other cutting instruments, and almost 9,000 were assaulted also with dangerous weapons uh, such as blunt objects, uh, vehicles, multiple cocktails, things like that, rocks. Uh, total of 46,698 were also assaulted with personal weapons, hands, feet, headbutts, spit, tackle, kick, all that kind of stuff. So quite, quite a few dangers for us to look out for uh, in the field. This is an interesting stat from this year that I recently came across, and this is again from the FBI uh, Leoka summaries. And all of these these stats and numbers that I'm putting up here are all available to you in the public. Uh, if you Google FBI UCR, uh, you'll be able to go to that website and you can pull a lot of this stuff on your own. And I see we have a question, and I'm guessing it's probably related to what we're talking about. Go ahead. You got it. Uh, is assault on a police officer a felony in Washington? Yes, it is. Correct. So uh, if you assault a police officer, it's, it's called uh, assault in the third degree, and it is a felony. Uh, and under that statute, there are several categories that are uh, protected. It's not just police officers. You also have corrections officers, uh, your, your transit bus drivers, uh, uh, nurses. What else am I missing? There's a couple more in there uh, that are in that statute. 
uh, they're specifically protected so that if you assault those persons while they're in their duties, uh, it is a felony assault as opposed to a misdemeanor assault that it would normally be. So, good question. Um, so on this slide here, the what we're looking at is the total felonious uh, law enforcement officer deaths from 2012 to 2020 so far, where we're at so far. Uh, and I think this was as of August 31st. Uh, and what's interesting here is not all of the felonious deaths are a result of ambushes or unprovoked attacks. Uh, this year, we're seeing a strikingly high number of, of those felonious deaths from ambushes or unprovoked attacks. It's about 30%. Uh, and you can see on the chart, uh, we haven't seen those numbers since 2016. Uh, where we were up around that same time frame. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's an alarming uh, number for us uh, when we talk about officers being ambushed and, and you know whether it's in their patrol car or out on a call and someone else comes up not associated with that call and, and ambushes the officer. Uh, in fact, just two nights ago, we had uh, a deputy working off duty at, at PLU uh, at Pacific Lutheran University at the campus there. Uh, he, had, he had written a ticket for a, a young man that blew through a stop sign. Uh, so he wrote him a ticket for failing to yield to the stop sign, gave him a break on not having insurance and a few other things. So it gave him a pretty good break on what could have been a pretty large ticket. Uh, and about 20 minutes later, uh, that same that same young man came back, this time on foot with his hoodie on and drawstrings closed so they couldn't see who he was, uh, circled around the deputy's car and with a big piece of uh, broken cement tried to break out the back windshield. So fortunately he wasn't armed with anything else or didn't try anything more heinous uh, uh, other than just trying to vandalize the car. Uh, and the deputy was inside the car at the time. So, uh, and they, had to, they ended up catching him. Um, his motive was other than upset about getting the ticket, so. Arrests in America. Now, this is from uh, 2017 numbers from the FBI. This was the last numbers that I could dig up where, where we had a complete year's numbers. Um, and, and 2017 total arrests around the country, approximately 10,554,985. So about 28,918 a day. That's a lot of um, incidents. Now that's just arrests. That's not total police contacts. If we look at just number of calls where police are contacting people, uh, you're going to add millions more to these numbers. Um, we take those numbers and we look at arrests where a death results. Now, if if officers are arresting someone and a death results, that doesn't always mean uh, that the officer is in any way involved uh, or that it was a shooting or anything like that. Uh, there could be other accidental things. Suspect has a heart attack. Suspect is has a lot of um, you know drugs or methamphetamine or something like that in their system at the time of the arrest, and that results in them dying at some point either during or just after the arrest. So there's other reasons that someone might die other than just, you know, getting in a shooting or something like that with, with police. Um, but about 64% of those uh, in that, in that on average are from what we would call a homicide. And now it, you have to be careful. And I know, I know it's been in the media quite a bit lately, but when we classify an officer involved shooting as a homicide, all that means is the person died by an unnatural cause. That doesn't mean that the officer wasn't justified in what they're doing or that they were justified. There still has to be an investigation that follows. Uh, they just rule that way. When Emmy rules a death, they only have a few things to choose from. Um, and it's either they died by suicide, accidental, natural, or it's a homicide. Um, so they don't, the like ME doesn't make a decision whether or not it's a justifiable homicide uh, or not. He just, the person died by unnatural causes. So homicide. Um, so if we take those numbers and these numbers, <coughs> the number of officer involved shootings and the people that are shot and killed every year in police instance, it's hard to find an exact number. Uh, those aren't, that's something we have to do better as, as a whole, as a, as a profession. The, they don't track those all together. Each agency tracks their own but there's no nationwide database up until 2019 uh, there were, where one was created by the FBI. We haven't been doing a good job of tracking those all together, uh, but they do have a database now uh, that we're trying to get more departments on board with to track those in total. Question on this one? Well, it goes back a little bit. I was just clarifying sure. um, some of the, some of the follow-up comments related to the assault on the officers. Mm -hmm. um, why weren't there mass arrests or prosecutions for violence directed at police officers specifically related to the activity in Seattle? Okay, talking about the yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's that's probably not a, a question that I would be the expert to ask, to ask because I don't work up there. I think this is a unique time where we have a lot of politics in play as well. 
And I think uh, some of the uh, folks that were in charge of they were taking a little bit more of a hands-off approach. Um, we didn't see a lot of that here in Pierce County. Uh, we certainly didn't see it here in University Place. Um, we had a couple of incidents of some peaceful gatherings in, in, in the Tacoma area. None of those ended up in any kind of violence or anything like that. We were present just to make sure everybody was safe. Um, had we had any of the violence or any of us out there, you would have saw probably a different reaction from Pierce County uh, where we would have gone and enforced the laws uh, to make sure that the community members are safe, their businesses are safe, and their property is safe. So I think you're looking at, we talked about Seattle specifically, a little bit different uh, political anomaly up there. <laughs> so I'll keep my political opinions to myself for most of the night, but uh, I, I definitely would have been handled a little bit different than Pierce County. So. So we take a look at these numbers. Follow up was very diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> so as we take take a look at some of these numbers. Now that that number fluctuates uh, when we talk about the number of shootings every year that where you know police are involved in a shooting and, and someone dies. Uh, if you go to the Washington Post and you you go to that website, they actually keep probably some of the most accurate numbers on that. Uh, they do a good uh, job of searching just uh, databases, internet searches, uh, social media searches, just looking for all incidents. Uh, and they're usually right around a thousand per year uh, of those incidents. And when we take a look at that, you know, these numbers compared to the numbers of arrests, most often if, if there's a shooting, it's when we're arresting someone, most often. Um, so if we look at over 10 million, 10 and a half million arrests, and we had 1,900 of those times a death resulted, you're talking about 0.0018% of all those arrests. And if we take that 64% that are classified as a homicide or an unnatural death, you're looking at 1,216 incidents. You plug that in, you're looking at 0.00115% of all arrests and in an unnatural death. So it's a very small percentage. If we were to take that number and now plug it into the total number of police contacts, now your percentage is going to go microscopic. Um, so if we look at the number of contacts law enforcement are making throughout the country every day, the number of those that a result in any kind of use of force are less than one percent, and the number that result in in a death or a shooting are well below one percent. So, uh, a lot of what you see in the media are these very isolated incidents um, that that get focused on. They're not a definite. They're not definitely a picture of the overall scope of law enforcement and the job we're doing. Um, there are things that we should investigate and that we should learn from, and that if they're wrong, we should weed them out. But they're definitely not a picture of. Um, you know, everything that's going on in law enforcement, that those are the, the outliers for sure. So. <clears throat> All right. Speaking specifically to case law and what allows us to use force and how our force is governed. Uh, so us as citizens of the United States, uh, our right to be free and our right to uh, not have force used against us or to be seized uh, is protected by the Fourth Amendment. And that's what I have up on the slide here. Uh, and I won't read it verbatim to you. Feel free to read it if you've never, if you've never, uh, you probably remember it from school. So that is your Fourth Amendment right, and it says that you are free from unreasonable search and seizure. A use of force is a seizure, uh, even as basic as me with a, you know, a, my police badge on. I point at you and I say, "You, police, stop right there." That is a use of force. That's a, it's not a physical force. We call it a force de minimis. But I'm using my authority to seize you and stop you. I have now taken away your right uh, of free movement. And if you don't do that, it's your, you could be committing a crime of resisting arrest or obstruction, if, depending on how it goes. Um, so I have to, in order to do that, I have to do a couple of things. Number one, if you read the Fourth Amendment, it says I can't do that. It says I sh I sh your rights shall not be violated unless I am able to support what I'm doing by an oath of probable cause or if I have a warrant signed ahead of time from a judge. And the way our officers will relay their probable cause uh, in, in other words, what their reason was for making that arrest and seizing you is later when they write their police report and describe uh, all the elements that led up, all the facts that they had that led them to believe that this person, uh, you know, either was or was about to commit a crime or had committed a crime. Um, if they have a warrant, that's something we get ahead of time, signed by a judge, and then we'll serve that on that person from there. So that's what protects you. That's the <clears throat> your protection under the Constitution. Um, we'll get back into a little bit of, of specifically uh, how our force is, is governed. So policy wise, we have two types of force that that our deputies are authorized to use. Uh, they use just regular force, which is uh, 
any physical techniques, tactics, chemical agents, or weapons to another person, and then deadly force, which is any intentional force likely to produce death or serious physical injury. And we'll talk a little about that as we go through some of the options, but uh, deadly force isn't just the firearm. It could be other things that could produce serious physical injury, um, especially when we talk about police officers protecting themselves uh, from a suspect posing harm to them. It doesn't have to just be a gun or bullets flinging at them. Anything that's going to cause them a serious bodily injury, uh, they also are able to protect themselves from. We don't expect our deputies to go home with, you know, large cuts that need stitches and broken bones and, and concussions and things like that. Um, they can protect themselves from those incidents. Uh, there is a third type of force that exists in the area where we live and work, and that is in the Ninth Circuit, uh, which covers us in Oregon and California. And, and a lot of the laws that we see out of the Ninth Circuit come from some landmark cases in California. Um, but according to the Ninth Circuit, not all types of, of that regular force or non lethal force are equal. What they say is that some cause a little bit greater pain and a little bit greater intrusion on your Fourth Amendment rights, and that comes from several cases. Uh, and what they've laid out in those cases are a few, a few tools uh, that in order to use those tools, you have to articulate an, an active resistance and then some type of immediate threat either to the officer or someone else on scene or to the safety of others. And if you can't articulate those two things, then you can't use some of these tools. And what the courts have said are strikes, so punching, kicking, things like that, knee strikes, elbow strikes. Those are sometimes in that intermediate force category where we need a little bit better justification. We need that act of resistance immediate threat. And they're real gray on the strikes. It has a lot to do with who is doing the striking, who are they striking, how are they striking them? Uh, you know, is there a difference between, uh, let me have Casey come over here for a second. <laughs> All my instructors are bigger and taller than me. <laughs> so I stay protected. Okay? There's a big difference between, uh, you know, Casey's big old fist, you know, hitting me uh, in, the, in the head uh, a couple of times and someone of my stature hitting him, you know, in the body or something like that. These are these kind of strikes. The courts are going to look at those as just a regular use of force. Whereas Casey, if he was, you know, with his size and advantage and power advantage hitting me in a more sensitive target like that, where it's more likely to cause a serious injury or broken bones or maybe even concussions, they're going to look at that as more of a intermediate level of force. So he's going to have a little bit more justification. So thank you. Thank you for being bigger and stronger than me. <laughs> um, impact weapons. So we're talking about our batons, uh, our, our um, grab one here, and I'm going to I'm actually have Casey demo this one for you. So this is uh, one of our uh, standard batons that we issue. Um, it's a 21 inch metal baton. Uh, officers also are given a, a longer SL21 flashlight, which is a you know a bigger flashlight. Those can also be used as a impact weapon if they need. Um, and, and these are, you know, I'm gonna have Casey give it a couple of whacks on the bag here, but these, these can definitely cause some, uh, some pain, uh, to try and stop somebody or impede somebody that's violent or violently resisting. So as he takes a couple hits here, okay. So that, if you can imagine that to your, um, you know, the, your side of your legs or your arms or your torso or anything like that. Uh, that's going to cause some some pain, probably some some bruising. Um, so we definitely are going to look at the situation and make sure we have a little bit more justification to use a tool like that. Um, someone that's just passively resisting or verbally resisting, uh, we're, we're not going to be striking with those kind of instruments uh, because they hurt. Um, OC spray is another intermediate force tool that we um, that we use sometimes. Um, a lot of deputies will. We'll shy away from this a little bit because it's it's very messy uh, and, and you can put in the chat if you've ever been sprayed with this stuff uh, mm -hmm. and, and liked it. Uh, I don't think we'll see anything on that. Uh, this stuff is, is awful when it gets you. It, it hurts. Uh, it makes your eyes close uh, inadvertently. Uh, you have to really struggle to keep them open. I've been sprayed a couple of times in training, uh, as has Casey. Um, in fact, the first time he got sprayed, his face was completely orange from the stuff. It was pretty funny. Um, he didn't like it either. Uh, then once you rinse it off, it, it has a kind of a burning sensation on your skin. It doesn't cause any any actual um, blistering or scarring or anything like that. It's just inflammation from the skin. Uh, it's it's actually not a chemical irritant. Um, it's an inflammatory substance. 
Um, it's actually rated by the FDA as a food substance. So you could actually eat this if you wanted to. Uh, we used to have a deputy that put it on his food, Ken Aiken used to put it on his, I watched him put it on his food and then eat it. So uh, it's just made from peppers. So, so it's, there's nothing in there that would hurt you as far as chemicals, uh, but it definitely hurts. Uh, and it's probably about 30, 45 minutes that your skin will burn afterwards. Uh, I always describe it as like a really bad sunburn is what I feel uh, after getting hit with this stuff. But um, it definitely can stop somebody. We do have several incidents where we've used it and people have, have wiped it off and just kept coming uh, and, and it does nothing. Um, if you're, you know, psychologically not there or on drugs or just really, really motivated, you can fight right through this stuff uh, and keep doing whatever you were doing before you got sprayed with it. Um, a lot of officers will shy away from using it because when you spray it, it tends to get everywhere because after we spray it, you got to go in still and, and, and get them to the ground and handcuff them and detain them. And then, and now this stuff gets everywhere. So not, not the, the funnest photo, but it can be a useful one. So, uh, and then we also have our, our taser, which I will just kind of show. I'm not going to do the, the deployment yet. We'll save that towards the end here. In fact, I'll take the cartridge off so it's safe here. We have two taser instructors for the, for the department, uh, Deputy Bellman, who works Great River Patrol, and then myself. Um, so the taser that we use is, is right here. This is, uh, most of the guys have this. It's an X26P, uh, a digital platform taser. Um, I'll give you an idea of what it sounds like just without the cartridge on. Uh, so that's what it sounds like. When you shoot the cartridge, these will deploy uh, two little probes out that are connected to some insulated wires uh, that will carry the charge uh, to, to the subject if they're hit. Um, everybody talks about the voltage or wants to know the voltage with, that these carry. These, these carry 50,000 volts, uh, but that's a little bit misleading. Um, if you hit someone and delivered 50,000 volts, you would kill them. Uh, it's not the voltage that we measure. Uh, when we're talking about what someone's getting, it's the amperage that we're getting, because that's the amount that's actually delivered. Uh, and that is, is the amperage on these is, is far less. It's less than um, one milliamp. Um, so the, uh, the reason it has 50,000 volts is so that it has enough pushing power to be able to push uh, the charge through clothing and thick clothing and any gaps and able to jump those gaps to still try to get contact with the body. Um, so that's, a, that's what a taser, what we call a, a CEW conducted electronic weapon. That's what it looks like. We'll, we'll fire it a little bit later so you can see it and hear it. These are fairly effective when they, um, when they make contact in the right spot in order to be super effective, the probes have to land about a foot away from each other. And ideally, they would be one above the belt line and one below the belt line. If we can do that, we'll get what we call neuromuscular incapacitation, where the, the larger muscles in the body will lock up. We'll generally see the ability where people can still move limbs and things like that a little bit, but their larger muscles will lock up, cause them to fall or not be able to get up if they're already on the ground. Um, and, and that's if we get a good spread. If we get a shorter spread because we're too close when we shoot this thing, We'll get some localized pain in that area and you'll, you'll definitely get a shock, but it's not necessarily going to lock someone up and stop them. So you really have to be about seven to, to 15 feet away with these uh, to make them, you know, ideal. Uh, every year, our numbers on these, as far as effectiveness, hover right about the high 50 to low 60 percent. So they're not they're not the, the end all be all when it comes to, you know, stopping a fight, but they definitely can be a useful tool when used correctly. So. And we'll put that back in here so we're safe and don't accidentally shoot anything. Question. Do those represent a health risk to people on the other end? Yes. And so here's here's the deal. They, uh, I'll tell you what Taser says. So if you, you can go on, you can go on that. It's not actually Taser. It's not the name of the corporation where it's Axon, A-X-O-N. So if you want to go on their website and read about it, you can. And these actually are not this exact model, but there are models these available to the public um, that you can purchase. They're, they're pretty expensive. I think they're right around a thousand dollars. And obviously you can't take them in uh, airports, courtrooms, things like that, but they do make um, these as well as some other stun gun type ones that you can purchase yourself. Uh, but if you go on there, they'll, they'll show you some of their risk warnings. They do have, uh, they call them a less, uh, a less lethal tool, but not a non-lethal tool. So they have a small risk of causing a uh, cardiac incident, i.e. a heart attack. Uh, the risk is very, very low. Uh, the way Taser puts it, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's not high, but it's not zero either. It's, it's, um, 
it's we've never had one, but there have been. I think nationwide there's been 54. You guys can Google a fact check me, but I think it's 54 incidents of death uh, resulting from a taser. Most of those are misuse of the taser, where they've the, the officer has fired the taser uh, and held it too long, or they've been tased too many cycles, or maybe there was other pre-existing conditions uh, going on, and maybe the officer didn't know that. Um, there's been a couple uh, that were just a gross misuse of the taser, where the officer held it for, in one case, they held it for almost 90 seconds. Um, that one's still under investigation. That was from a couple of years ago. That was in the state of uh, Nevada. Um, so, but o overall, if it's used correctly, the risk is extremely low. Uh, but there is there is a risk. Uh, I've been tased. Casey's been tased, uh, and it's not something that we. It's not a high enough risk where the courts have deemed it a, a deadly force tool. Uh, it's not reasonably likely to cause death at all. Um, what it usually will cause, though, is is injuries from the fall. Because now, you when you lock someone up, uh, they're going to fall uncontrollably to the ground. So you'll get you know maybe teeth broken out or lacerations from that. So that's why the justification to use that type of tool has to be a lot higher. So we're using that against someone who's violently resisting uh, and a threat to somebody. Um, another question. Just a comment, thank you. Those numbers are pretty impressive given the numbers. Um, and another follow-up question, does every officer carry a taser? Uh, almost, a lot of our detectives don't carry them anymore just because they don't have a need for them. They're not out making the same context, but most everybody in patrol uh, carries one. And in order to carry one, uh, they have to go through a certification class uh, and then they recertify, I think it's biannually on that tool, we, re we recertify uh, with the taser. Uh, and as long as they stay certified, they can carry it. So good question. Okay. And then the last uh, intermediate force tool is the vascular neck restraint. I'm going to hold off on that one because I have some slides specific to that one. But that is the uh, neck restraint tool that we use. Um, and again, that's something that we're going to use at an intermediate level. So someone who's actively resisting and a threat, uh, we would be able to use that tool at level two. Okay. Okay, so reasonable force. So the way our force is judged, the Supreme Court standard uh, calls it a reasonable use of force. So whenever somebody uses force and we go to investigate it or we look at it, we want to determine was that a reasonable use of force. Um, we have to be careful when we talk about, uh, you know, was it the best thing or the best decision? Remember, these things are happening quick. They're happening, uh, you know, with no time to sit back and, and weigh options and make decisions. You're making a quick decision to overcome resistance or protect yourself, protect someone else. And so you're just relying on your training and acting as fast as you can. And so it's it's uh, it'd be impossible to ask officers to always make the absolute 100 percent best decision. It's just it's just not realistic. Um, I consider myself pretty well trained and pretty well versed in the world of defensive tactics. Um, I've taught martial arts and 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 uh, combatives for over 20 years uh i will still make you know look at my use of force go oh i could have done this a little bit better or maybe this technique would have worked better there but again when you do it in real time it's not that simple um, so all we ask is and what the supreme court asks is that they make a reasonable decision uh, not every officer is going to do the same thing in every use of force situation because we all have different skill levels different sizes um, different ages, different injuries uh, that we bring to work with us. So there's there's certain things that I could do or, or not do uh, that maybe Casey can or can't do uh, and vice versa. So the standard is set by a case from uh, the 80s called Graham v. Connor. And that standard is called the reasonable officer standard. It's a balancing test used to judge if an officer's use of force was justified. And it's got a few prongs here. Number one is would another officer with the same or similar training and experience but in like or similar circumstances, would that officer respond the same or use similar judgment? And the reasonable officer, then, like I said, does not require the best decision, only a reasonable one. So the first problem is that we want to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples. You know, is same, same or similar training experience of the officer. Uh, and then that we're talking about a similar circumstance. And again, use similar judgment. The, the standard prior to this case uh, was from a case called Johnson v. Click, and we used to call that the, the shocking to the conscious standard. And that was a very subjective standard where when I go back and, and review the incident later, is the use of force so shocking that it 
oh my gosh, I can't believe the officer did that. Um, the problem with that is it's very subjective and it takes a lot of 2020 hindsight into account. A lot of stuff that we learned later that wasn't available to the officer at the time he used force. Um, and, it, and again, it's very subjective to the opinion of whoever is reviewing it as opposed to just looking at the objective facts that were available to the officer at the time of the use of force. Reasonable this test. Application of this test requires analysis of the force being objectively reasonable under the totality of the circumstance, okay? Including these factors to determine if the seizure is reasonable. Now, there's a lot that goes into the totality of the circumstances. Um, when you watch a 15 second video clip of a use of force, you're getting just a little smidgen of the story uh, and the way cameras work. Sometimes you're getting just an isolated view of it. You're not seeing what's, what's happening off camera or around or what preceded that or what followed that. Um, you don't have any of the backstory. You don't know the, uh, the history of the criminal uh, or the suspect that's, that uh, is in the video. You don't know the history of the officer uh, or any of their training, experience, stuff like that. So there's still a lot uh, to, to be determined. I can look at some videos and be pretty sure, you know, that, hey, that, that looks pretty good or, or, you know what, that looks like excessive force. But even I would still want to know more before I made a firm decision uh, or a finding. So... One of the things that Graham set for us when we look at the severity of the crime, you know, it's a big difference between dealing with a, you know, uh, stealing a candy bar from the grocery store versus a, an armed robbery or kidnapping or a, a murder or rape or something like that. Those are two very different things where different levels of force are going to be uh, okay to use uh, to, to apprehend that suspect. I have a much stronger government interest in apprehending a, you know, a kidnapper versus that, you know, petty shoplifter. So... Question? Yes. How often does the department assess its non-lethal um, armament for more effective updated equipment? Perfect. Uh, just about every year. So every year I get the, the stats. I'm going to go into, uh, in, in the slide towards the end, I'm going to show you some stats from what we call Blue Team. Blue Team is a program we use to track our uses of force uh, and, and other things too, but uh, that's what I'm interested in and, and look at from that program. Uh, and in that, it gives us a idea of what is working and also what is being used and what is not. Uh, you know, if we have a tool that we're spending training dollars and time on and nobody's using it or it's not being effective, then we need to reevaluate, is it worth the, the time and, and money that we're putting into training that particular tool or that particular tactic? Um, so every year I get a, a readout out that's sent to me on those and we reevaluate um, those as we go so annually. Just to follow up, uh, when you say standardization, are those Washington State or U.S. United States? Standardized. What are we talking about? Um, see if we can ask her to clarify. Yeah. Yeah. Standardization. Of lethal force, standardization of lethal force. Are we talking about the? Are we talking because about the taser being classified as lethal, non-lethal? Yes. We'll, we'll, Classifications of. Okay. Well, we'll we'll come back to it. But the um, we're talking specifically when we talk about when you can use those tools. Um, we're talking specifically about the Ninth Circuit, uh, which is which is our area here. So that would be state and and district area. Um, there have there have been. Um, the Supreme Court still hasn't hasn't uh, laid out that intermediate force level. They still just talk about force and deadly force, but they still, in a lot of their cases, will talk about the stronger government interest needed to use some of these these other tools. So she yeah. says just the guidelines. So I don't know if that clarifies better. Yeah. yeah. So, so the guidelines on a lot of these tools come from the district level, right. um, and then the the overall what we're talking about now, this Graham Reasonable Standard, this guideline here, this comes from the Supreme Court level. So this is. National from, from SCOTUS. So, uh, and then, and then our, our policy, our department's policy, our use of force policy is, is a derivative right from Graham. So most of what we have in our policy is, is pulled right from this Graham decision and, and the stuff that it laid out. Um, because ultimately, this is the way it's going to be judged. Anytime a police officer uses force, he's got to survive a, a couple of things if, it, if it's to be justified. Number one, he has to be within policy. Uh, or he could face punishment uh, there up to and including termination if he was outside of policy. Uh, and then he's got to be within the state law that allows him to use force. The state law 
and the state law under the new uh, Senate uh, Substitute House Bill 1064, which started out as I-940, if you haven't read that. Um, that new language in there very closely reflects Graham. It talks about the, for, uh, the force being objectively reasonable and, and looking at the object, objective facts. So it's, it's a very close to that. Uh, and then they have to survive uh, the Supreme Court standard, the national standard, federal. Uh, so those are the three arenas. Um, so it's very crime. We're also looking at any of, of the immediate threats to the safety of the officer or others. Those are a big factor. Uh, what kind of active resistance, if any, did the, the suspect pose or, or put forth? Uh, attempts to evade. Uh, there'll be certain crimes where if someone's running uh, away from us, we're able to use, use force to stop them from getting away. Um, we can use force uh, up to a certain amount to stop anybody running from any crime. Uh, but training-wise, we, you know, we take a look at the guy stole a, a, you know, a two dollar item, and now he's running down the street. That's not someone we're going to run across, run up to and hit him with a taser and make him fall down and, and lose teeth and things like that. That's not going to fit uh, what we need legally to be able to use a tool like that. And if we want to run up and catch that guy and grab him and use force to stop him, that would be okay. Me, in particular, I'm getting a little older now. I don't do that. <laughs> I just call where I last saw him, and hopefully we catch him and as he pops up. But um, we do, we do have the ability to use force against someone who's fleeing from us as well. Um, and the Graham decision also set forth and recognized and still recognized that officers are required to make those split second decisions uh, in, in circumstances that are tense, uh, uncertain, and rapidly evolving. And those, if you, if you ever want to go to sleep at night, just look up some use of force case law uh, like I do, and you can, you can read it. And they talk quite a bit about all the different decisions that the officers had to make in those, those short time frames. So. I have a quick question. And then this is straight from our, our policy here. Uh, and these are also straight from Graham. So again, officers are not required to retreat from a suspect threatening to use force. Uh, in this state, we can, we can stand our ground. Uh, if, if a suspect is threatening to use force against us. There are times when a tactical retreat makes sense. You know, if we approach something and we're outmanned or outgunned or, you know, I walk up and knock on the door to arrest someone and it's someone like Casey that answers the door and I say, you're, you're under arrest. And he says, no, I'm not. I say, no, you're not, but I'll be right back with three more people. <laughs> and we'll do it that way. Uh, so there are times when it might make sense to, to uh, retreat, uh, but we're not required to. Um, and again, our actions are not based on 2020 hindsight. It's everything that, that's known at the time. Uh, and all force, again, is based on the totality of the circumstances uh, known to the officer at the time of the force response. Question. OK, I want to first ask, there's someone who isn't muted and is asking, is that um, someone who's on the phone that can't type a question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. OK, why don't you go ahead and ask your question then? Uh, my question was like the way the climate is. I understand that, you know. So as we, especially in the state of Washington, in the liquidated area in Pierce County, and we have like so many homeless people that we already know, like the circumstances um, as far as using um, deadly force. Um, how is since we already know the climate and we know like a lot of people have mental Ill issues and. Um, mental issues, um, what other option do you have besides using a deadly force on that particular, it would depend on the situation, I guess. Uh, my okay. question is like, um, since we already know mental health has existed, a lot of people sleeping on the street, okay. um, do you have like, do you bring social worker with you to help you with that? Or do we just depend on the circumstances? It may not be something that needed deadly force. That was my question. Okay, okay, great. Good question. It's like I'm on the radio. First caller. Yes. <laughs> um, so, I can't log in and see. <laughs> I know. Okay, that's fine. So, so that's a great question. But we're gonna get into I'll, we're gonna get into deadly force a little bit later. I'll define exactly when officers use deadly force. But more specific to your question, when we talk about um, you know mental health, mental illness, uh, those kind of things, um, that's a, that's a big issue across the nation right now. Uh, and it's not just homeless people. I mean, we do have a lot of our transient population that does deal with mental illness. Some of it is natural. Some of it is from years of substance abuse. Uh, but we also have just, you know, folks who are not transient or not homeless, you know, that may be suffering from autism or traumatic brain injury, stuff like that. And we may get called to deal with those folks. Um, so first of all, every every deputy that we have has had 
uh, training in that uh, from the academy and then gets annual training as well every year uh, as it's refreshed. Uh, this year's training was on traumatic brain injuries. Um, the year before that, it was specifically on dealing with folks with autism. So each year they, they kind of target a specific um, problem or issue. So we get that training ourselves. Uh, but even I'll be the first to admit that we are not, even with that training, I'm not fully equipped uh, to, to, to handle those situations perfectly every time. So what we do have is we have a co-responder program uh, and those are a region. You're going to hear about that. Uh, you're getting you, guys are gonna, you guys are going to get a presentation on that. Um, from a use of force standpoint, as far as how we use them in the field, uh, and you'll get this more specific in that class, but they, go, they do go with us uh, to certain calls. Um, we, we can request them. We can request them after we get there and realize that we need them. Uh, they're a great resource for us. Uh, we have more comments from what I understand as well. Uh, if, if it's a dangerous situation where, you know, weapons are involved or threats or something like that, sometimes the, the officer will go first. We'll usually have them on standby, you know, just down the road or on the way. Uh, we go first to make sure that the scene is safe because they're not armed and they're not trained. They're not trained in use of force, not trained to defend themselves. They are just a, 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 a MHP uh, trained to co-respond with us. So we make the scene safe first. Um, if that involves, you know, taking weapons away from people or something like that, or getting people detained, sometimes we have to do that. And then we bring them in. But anytime we can use them and, and peacefully end something, that is a win for everybody. So, Jason, there's a couple, there's some questions that came in while you were having that sure. discussion. Um, why exactly would any use of force be justified for someone who's fleeing? It seems like that has gotten a lot of police departments across the nation in trouble. Sure. Yeah. So here's here's what we what we look at, and and, and that's why I say uh, the amount of force you're going to use is going to be different for for each fleeing suspect. Um, specific to like a, a DV case, uh, someone is fleeing from a DV. What we see a lot of times with domestic violence cases is we see a pattern uh, where the violence will will ramp up over time. It may start as you know first we go out for an argument. We do that a few times, then we go out and there's an actual assault. And now we go out and they, you know, the suspect has burglarized the residence uh, after they've been kicked out and there's an order in place. Um, and now, look, we just had one the other night uh, where we had ex that exact thing. He's previous had made some threats. He had burgled the place a little bit and now it's ramping up. And now he goes out and strangles her, uh, you know, to near unconsciousness, uh, you know, where she can't breathe. Um, so now it's ramped up to a, a felony assault level. So we have a duty to try and capture that person. Uh, that person did flee uh, in, in a vehicle when we tried to apprehend them. Uh, that's a person that we are going to try to put some effort into uh, catching that person uh, and making sure that, that, that they're put in jail and, and hopefully uh, stop from continuing to that level or that, that path that they're on, uh, which can ultimately end in homicides uh, and has multiple times uh, uh, and, and, and um, anything that we can do is to stop that. We want to do that for those kinds of cases. Um, if we're talking about a low level crime misdemeanor, that's something, again, we're, we're probably not even going to chase that person if they're fleeing, or uh, we may chase them a little bit, but we're not going to use a taser or pepper spray or some kind of force tool like that, uh, unless we catch up to them and now they turn and they assault us. Now, now you're dealing with another different level of crime. Um, when we talk specifically about shooting people that are fleeing, there is specific case law to that. And I believe I have that in my slides on deadly force, and I'll get to that when we get there. But there is specific case law, and there are specific times when uh, around the country that has happened, uh, even in this department it has happened. Uh, and those are very specific cases where that person is an extreme danger to the public or, uh, you know, has made threats to come back and kill someone if they, if they uh, you know, if police are called or, things like that, and we have enough proof to, to show that if we let that person get away, they are a, a direct danger to you know other officers, the public, you, your family, things like that. So that's not, that, that person is not going to be, we're going to do whatever we can to catch that person. Now, if we can catch them other means other than shooting them, we're going to try to do that first. But if we can't, then that would be on the table for us in those kind of cases. And I'll get to that specific case. So, um, and this may come later too, we got the, sh why not shoot him in the leg question. And so that, I don't know if you've got that covered. Okay, good, <laughs> good. Um, and then, so that's coming later, I'm assuming. Sure. Okay, and then um, there was a follow-up to your your response on that one, which was, but it's a matter of use of force. Does a traffic stop warrant that? So again, it depends. So we have a, a specific policy on pursuits and traffic pursuits. 
And so it depend it would all depend on what the traffic stop is for. Um, so if we if we stopped someone, we tried to stop someone because they had their taillight was out. That's a pretty low level offense, uh, and that person takes off fleeing. They are now committing a, a felony crime called felony eluding, which puts the public in a little bit of danger. That's something where we could pursue if if we choose to, and we really look at a lot of factors on those. Uh, you know, if it's daytime uh, down where I work on Meridian, uh, which is a pretty uh, busy, or over here on Bridgeport, where it gets pretty busy, we're not going to chase that. Uh, the sergeant's going to say terminate that, and that the, the danger to the public is just too great for what we're chasing. Um, but again, if it's a higher level crime or there's more to it from that traffic stop, maybe the guy in the, in the car has some felony warrants, or he's again he's that DV suspect we're looking for, or a robbery suspect we're looking for, that might warrant um, a little bit more effort. Uh, to try and apprehend that person. So. Then the last question, which you may hit later, is Washington a qualified immunity state? Yes, Washington still does have qualified immunity. Uh, I don't think I have that in here, but I, I can't address it. Um, qualified immunity is, is, is um, it's, I don't think it's quite what people think. It's, it doesn't give us uh, full immunity to do whatever we want. Um, we still are under a lot of strict guidelines and laws and case level for what we can do and what we're allowed to do. Um, full immunity would, would mean we could just go and do whatever and not, and not be held liable. Like doctors, doctors have full immunity when they work and doctors kill far more people every year in this country than police do. You can, you can look that up, <laughs> probably 10 to 20 times more, not on purpose, but on, you know, accidentals, but they have full immunity. So their, you know, their insurance covers it and they don't, they don't, uh, unless it's something criminal, they don't get in trouble for it. What we have is qualified immunity, where if someone wants to sue an officer uh, or, or take us to court uh, for a, a, either a wrongful death or a, a excessive use of force or an unlawful arrest, you've got to prove two things. You've got to prove that A, the, uh, the violation existed, so excessive force was used, um, or, or that it, you know, in, a, in a court uh, with a jury, it's possible to show that it was used. Um, and they have to show that, that that right or that law existed at that time. Um, so it's pretty simple. It's really just a two-pronged deal. Um, when we talk about, um, when I get into a case later, when I talk about deadly force, that what the officer did in that case, if he were to do that now, he'd be in prison. But at the time he did it, it was still within the law. So we can't hold him accountable to something that was within the law then just because after it happened, we decide to change the law. That, that wouldn't be fair uh, justice to, to that person. Um, and again, you have to be able to prove that there was an actual violation of a constitutional right. And that's all qualified immunity is. It doesn't give us, it doesn't give me protection to go out and, and thump whoever I want just because I don't like them. I, I still have to be able to justify what I'm doing and be within the policy of the state law and the federal law. So it's, it's not this overarching big protection that, that, uh, that a lot of people have a misunderstanding of. So, all right, let's see, moving forward. Okay, so we talked a little bit about, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little demonstration first and then we'll watch this video. So don't play the video, I can't have that circuit. All right, so this is, this is, uh, this is a training gun. So uh, this is a cert gun. Let me make it big. It's got a little, I can, yeah, that's fine, yeah. So it's got a little fake uh, magazine in here. There's no, but nothing comes out. It has just a little light that comes out. I'll try not to shoot it straight at the camera. Um, My computer's lagging, so it could be. So what we'll do is we're gonna do a little action versus reaction drill. We talk about how fast things happen in law enforcement and, and decisions being made. So this is something where you can, normally you'd be in a classroom with me here and, and, and we will play this, but you can play along at home. Uh, so grab, if you don't have, if you have a pen handy uh, that has a clicker on it, click, 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 that'll be your uh, trigger, okay? So what you're going to do is as I hold this gun, I'm going to hold it down on my side, okay? And I'm going to raise it up and I'm going to fire a shot towards the camera. And that'll be, that'll be the threat coming up and, and engaging you. And what you want to do is you want to try to react uh, when you see that. So you're going to get some cues. You know, when I go to move, my shoulder's going to move a little bit. My arm's going to come up. I might, I might give it away with my non-poker face, okay? And that gun's going to come up. So you'll have some, some time to react in there and just going to see if you can outdraw me. Uh, with that pin clicker. So if you're clicking that pin before I've got that up there, then you win. Okay. So we'll we'll do a little bit, and you can you can comment on the chat of, of how you're doing and if you got me or outdrew me. So whenever you're ready, just have your pin ready. Okay. 
And again, whenever you see my movement, I just want you to try to outdraw me. Okay. How are we doing? Is anybody is anybody starting to get ahead of me? You should be as I do it a few times. Some of you should be. They may be to. looking for pens right now. Okay. We're still looking for pens. <laughs> okay, so somebody says, sure, that makes um oh wait. Um he said I only beat you once. Hey. I'm, dead. I'm dead three times. Yeah. And now here's the problem too. Here's the problem with this drill. Uh even if you even if you you beat me or you get your, your shot up there and you hit me before I can get my gun up. Uh, what is most likely to happen if you were to shoot me center mass with, with a round, me even two rounds or three rounds? The most likely outcome is that I'm going to do exactly what I was doing before. I'm not going to fly back 40 feet and hit the wall like in the movies. My arm is still going to come up. My finger is still going to pull the trigger. So at best, we're probably going to get a tie uh, if we're waiting for that uh, type of movement before we react. Um, Hollywood has kind of uh, given us some, a lot of misleading information about what happens when people actually get shot. Uh, unless you get an incapacitating round that takes out the basal portion of the brain, either through the back or from front to back, or something that severs the, the spinal cord, um, that person's going to keep coming and has the ability to keep coming and doing what they're doing until they there's enough you know blood loss where they, they, they die. Uh, even a shot directly to the heart uh, you would think that would, you know, put someone down and instantly kill them. That's not, that's not necessarily the, the truth. And that's not necessarily what happens in shootings. Um, so we'll do this a few more times. And now, and also understand that we're making a very simple decision. All we're doing is when that gun comes up, I'm clicking the pin. So it's a very simple decision. We're not looking for any other cues or anything like that. The problem comes when we make a decision. So some of you probably clicked your pin right there and you just shot an unarmed person that was surrendering. I was just dropping my firearm. Okay. So those are, those are split second hard decisions that are made, uh, you know, trying to make them just based on training what you have at the time. Um, so let's watch a video now here uh, where some officers maybe have to make a similar fast decision and maybe they make the wrong decision. Ready? Yeah, go ahead. So this is a, a SWAT team, a partial SWAT team out of Arizona that's serving a warrant here. High risk warrant. Okay, go high low, guy. Hold up, move up, high low. Okay, that's enough knocking. Move out. Come into the door! Come to the door! Come to the door! Drop the gun! 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 And so what you saw there was the subject answered the door. It was pretty clear who was at the door. Uh, he answers the door, sees several fully uniformed uh, police officers. Uh, in fact, SWAT teams, so they wear even more gear. Um, and he answers the door with a gun in hand. Uh, they wait, they wait. They try to go to a taser, which never has, a taser has no place uh, in a situation like that. Uh, when, we're, when we're met with force, we're supposed to be overcoming force to overcome that resistance. Um, otherwise we end up dead or hurt. And so what happened in this case, one officer was shot. It's hard to, it's hard to see in the video and it's hard to hear, but he actually got off two rounds before they, uh, shot him. Uh, when he raised the gun up, just, just like we were doing here, uh, he was able to do that, uh, before the, those officers were able to click their pen a few times. So he got off two rounds, hit one officer, uh, in, in the, in the vest. And then one officer, very lucky, he got shot through and through. It actually went through the front of his vest here and skimmed across. Uh, and he's lucky it didn't go a few inches more to the, to the side. Uh, the, the vests and things that we wear give very limited protection in these areas here. They're, they're, they're pretty decent against handgun rounds right in this area and in the back. But they have a lot of weak points in the side and up above uh, in the neck area and things like that. And, of course, the head's not as well protected. Uh, even those helmets that those guys are wearing, they offer some protection uh, against the small handgun rounds, but against larger rounds or rifle rounds, they offer no protection. So 
<clears throat> so again, action versus reaction. You're 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 always going to be you know behind the curve if you're trying to wait and 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 react to that. And unfortunately, that's what we are forced to do a lot of times. When we use force, we're responding to what someone else is doing and then making a force response off of that and trying to play catch up. So we always start behind the curve and then hopefully catch up to overcome. So this is just my question. Sure. From the so how, how critical <laughs> is it when you give a command, um, you know, and you're, you're kind of escalating these forces and you're using your, you know, I recognize that, <clears throat> that, you know, after the incident has occurred, if there's been a violation of some kind, that's when that's pursued. But during an event, mm -hmm. how important is that? Yeah, so verbal commands are, are very important uh, and it's very important that they're, they're followed because when we're giving verbal commands, we're looking at a lot of things going on. And if, if, if the person we're talking to isn't doing what we're telling them to do, uh, it, can, it can go wrong real fast. They're also required for us to give us in certain situations. So anytime uh, we're using deadly force, um, we're required, if, if feasible, to give a verbal command ahead of, ahead of that force as to perceive that force. And that's, that's not a new law that's, uh, that's covered. I think it's covered in, in 940, uh, 1064, but that was actually a law already uh, before that. And that's something that we've been doing for years uh, since 1985 and the Tennessee v. Gardner decision that, that was established. So that has to include who we are, what we want that person to do. Uh, and what the consequence of not doing that is. And so that has to precede that. So it's very important. Uh, another training thing that we do when, when we train um, defensive tactics, we train giving those verbal commands. We train to use them, you know, as we're hitting the, the bags or the dummies or we're training with each other, we use those verbal commands so that we get in a good habit of, of getting those and, and trying to get people to comply with those. We also try to train our folks to be specific in their verbal commands uh, because stop resisting, stop resisting, stop resisting. Well, that's, that's good and that's a start. That doesn't really tell a suspect what to do to make, you know, what's happening to them stop. So if I'm, if I'm, you know, using a pain compliance technique or something on someone, if I'm just saying stop resisting, that doesn't tell them. But if I say, hey, you know, go down onto your knees, lay down onto your stomach, things like that, that tells them, hey, if you do this, that pain that I'm applying to your wrist or whatever will stop. Um, and so it's important that we give some specific verbal commands in those situations to really help ourselves out. Uh, and that, that's a two-way you. Public, uh, the people we deal with need to follow the commands, and then we also need to give clear and concise commands as much as we can. And sometimes in stressful situations, uh, that can be hard. And in different environments, you know, when I'm on the side of the freeway, things are loud, you might not be able to hear some of those commands. So it can be very challenging at times. Okay, one more question here, it looks like. Uh, what about a person who's threatening self-harm? How is this handled? Yeah, so the person that's threatening self-harm, and again, those are case by case. Those we, we um, you know, obviously, we have to also worry about people that are around them because people that are, are threatening self-harm, we, we want to always try to isolate them and clear everybody else out so that they're not a danger. Um, there's been several incidents where, you know, the person may be threatening themselves one moment and now someone else comes into that area and now they're threatening that person and, and we have that danger as well. Um, those are times when we would definitely try to use that co-responder if we can uh, to try to establish some communication with them and try to talk them down. Um, we always try to use time, distance, and shielding. We do that with anyone um, uh, whenever we can, but anything we can put more distance between us and that person um, so that we don't uh, you know, produce a reaction or, or, or push the issue. Uh, if we can put tables, chairs, things in between us to make sure that if they do decide to come for us, there's obstacles they have to get over. Uh, those are always good. And then shielding if we have it available you know, by using cover um, available to us, we'll do that. Um, there are times when, you know, if, if a person is threatening self-harm and they're in their house by themselves and no one else is in there and we can confirm that, we have, a lot of times don't even, we're not going to go in the house on those ones. We'll try to communicate them, you know, verbally on the phone if we can, shouting into the window, whatever, we'll do it that way. But we're not going to go in and force the issue and, and, and make it to where we have to, you know, shoot them or use force when they present a weapon towards us. Um, we're only going to go in on those if there's other people in the house that we feel might be in danger. Uh, so those are, those are very unique situations. And, and we do a really good job in this department, I think, overall as a professional handling those. And having those co-responders now uh, especially will help. Because if we can get there and isolate them and, and just set up a good scenario where we have some distance and then bring in that co-responder and let them help us with some of the verbal skills, um, that can be very, very good for us. So good question. Uh, but we do have uh, a legal right to use force to stop them from hurting themselves if we can. 
Uh, and actually, under RCW 9816020 and subsection five or six, I think it's six, uh, U.S. citizens actually have a legal right to stop someone and use physical force to stop someone from hurting themselves. It has to be a necessary and reasonable amount of force. So you has to be just enough force to get them to stop. But if if you had someone, you know, relative or someone that was threatening to hurt themselves or picked up a bottle of pills and was threatening to swallow the whole bottle, you could physically, you know, take that person and hold them uh, until help got there. You would be within your legal rights in this state to do that. <clears throat> do we need to take a break? We good? We're good. Okay, <laughs> I'm good. Move on. I'll talk all night. Okay. I had no plans. Okay. <laughs> What are, de what are defensive tactics? Okay, so defensive tactics. So we'll get into a little bit more specific to the training side and, and what the tactics we use. So uh, when we think defensive tactics, a lot of folks, and, and we bring our new hires in and we give them this, we give them a lot of the same material. Um, they think that defensive tactic means, you know, how we punch, how we grab someone, how we use a taser. But there's a lot more to that. It's the strategies and the tactics and the skills and everything we used uh, to prevent that inherent risk posed to law enforcement. Uh, anything that we can do ahead of time to make it so we don't have to use force is good. Uh, if I can go to a call and I can arrest someone without any incident, that is far less headache for me and anyone else. It's better for them. It's better for the suspect. They don't get hurt. I don't get hurt. My report is easier. Uh, there's no lawsuits afterwards, you know, and so it's just, it's just a better all around solution. And, and that's what we always push for. Um, so, you know, just the little stuff that we do, you know, when I go to a, a call for a domestic violence call, uh, I don't pull right up into the front of the house and with my lights and sirens going to, to upset anybody uh, and jump out and boom, I'm faced with a problem. I park a couple houses down and I slowly walk up and listen and, and try to hear what's going on so that if there is something that's going on that I need to respond to, I have time to make a decision about what I'm going to do. Um, so those are just some, you know, some of the strategies we use. Um, high risk vehicle stop. If you've ever seen us on the side of the road with our cars fanned out and we have our guns drawn and we're talking somebody out of the vehicle, that's probably a, a you know a, a, a felony suspect or a dangerous suspect that we're we're talking them back. And that, believe it or not, is a de-escalation tactic. That's opposed to running up and trying to pull them out of the car, which just escalates the situation and, and creates you know a further need for use of force. Rather than that, we'll stand back with our time, our distance, and our shielding using our cars as shielding and try to talk them out so that we can take them into custody without having to use any force at all. Uh, so those are all just some of the, the, the skills and tactics besides just the hands-on, how, how do we actually handle somebody uh, that is fighting with us or, or resisting us. So training-wise, the new hires receive about 44 hours. Uh, sometimes it's 48, it just depends. We have to work around some of their, their new hire orientation scheduling. Um, with HR, but they usually get anywhere from 44 to 48 hours of pre-academy defensive tactics training. So this is before they even go to the academy. Uh, we're going to give them training, and that is a, an intense week mentally and physically. It involves a lot of uh, case law study, policy study, legal study. Um, there's a comprehensive test at the end of the week that you need an 80 percent to to pass on. Um, it, it's, a, it's a difficult test. Um, and we do a lot of preparation for it. And then the week includes a lot of physical work, uh, working all the techniques and things that they're going to be using. So we go over handcuffing, um, some universal rules and principles of combatives, uh, control tactics, defensive tactics, you know, for strikes and, and uh, striking with the batons, how to use uh, the OC spray. We talk about the vascular neck restraint. We talk about ground survival. So it's a pretty intense week covering a lot of subjects. Um, it's a lot of stuff that they're going to see again when they go to the, the basic academy. So we do that for two reasons. One, it gives them a little bit of leg up when they go to the academy. But two, these people are also going to see some pre-academy field time where they'll be out with a training officer uh, to get some experience and kind of immerse them in what the law enforcement world looks like uh, and give them an idea of what that schema is before they go to the CJTC. So we have to make sure that they have some training uh, to protect themselves and their partner before we put them out for that pre-academy FTO. Uh, they'll also get a separate eight-hour course just specifically for the taser. Uh, that's the course that's required by the manufacturer of the taser, so we give them that separately so we can focus just on that. Uh, and then when they go to the academy, it, it fluctuates uh, from time to time, but it's usually about 90 to 95 hours for each class uh, that they'll get a DT training during that five-month period where they're there. 
Um, and so that's spread out during that, that time. Um, once they, once they come out of there, they're probably the, the best trained that they're going to be ever in their career. Uh, <laughs> unless they continue to, uh, you know, uh, pursue that, that area of training, we give them, uh, more training annually. They get 10 hours annually of in-service training, just specific to defensive tactics. And each year that changes as far as what we're covering. Uh, we look at, you know, again, we look at what what is working, what is not working, what do we need to work on to get better at, uh, what are some of the things we're seeing nationwide where officers are, uh, you know, getting in, themselves in trouble for, or they're doing uh, maybe incorrectly or could be doing better when we try to add those things to our curriculum. Uh, we encourage them to participate in other training and exercise outside of work. Uh, one of the best things you can do to defend yourself or, or anything or just for longevity is just to stay physically fit. Uh, and, that, and that's good for their mental health too. There's a lot of mental stress in this job and that exercise, having that consistent exercise program really helps them stay mentally fit. Um, and if you have an officer that's mentally fit, they're gonna make better decisions <coughs> in the field. Um, we do are having uh, an open gym uh, that that uh, will provide extra DT training. That's in the works right now. Right now we have a, a small group that it's going to get that going. We're kind of stifled with, with COVID just like everybody else is. So, but once we're past that, we're, we are going to be opening in a, an open gym session where guys can come in. Um, it'll be voluntary, but they'll be able to come in and get some extra defensive tactics training. Uh, and then our instructors receive additional training throughout, throughout the year. Uh, Casey and I go to a, probably a minimum of a, about 40 hours a year of extra defensive tactics training just for instructors. Question. What physical fitness requirements are there <clears throat> after the year's over? I think that's what he meant. So after after you've been hired and you're you're in, you're done with the academy. So you have the uh, you have the Cooper test, uh, the standardized test uh, to get into law enforcement. Uh, after that, once you're in, there is no physical fitness standard for our department. Some some agencies uh, do have that. Most of them they they offer a a pay bump if you meet that uh, physical fitness standard. That's something that that is uh, based on their contract. It's not anything that's currently in our contract. So. Um, if you ever wanted to institute something like that, it was something that would have to go through uh, our guild and get signed off on that and be in as part of the contract. But currently, there's no uh, recurring annual physical fitness standard uh, that has to be met. Follow up to that. <clears throat> Are there steroid drug tests administered every year? No. And, you know, I'm obviously not on any of those. So. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Yeah, no, there's there's no annual there's there's testing. Obviously, there's intense uh, medical tests before you get hired, but there's no annual testing for steroids. So the comment is that the lack of physical fitness standards encourage going to the gun. Uh, I don't think so. I think what what encourages in our in some agencies and some and that's it's case by case and deputy by deputy and officer by officer. But it has to do with you know what is your confidence level in your skill and what is your comp and confidence level in your ability to handle certain situation. The gun is going to come out when it's needed uh, and when it's when it's uh, you know justified um, there's gonna be times when I've I, I, again I'm, I'm, I'm not bragging but I've, I've been doing this stuff for a long long time there are many times when I pull my gun out uh, because I know that there are people out there that are bigger and stronger and better than me and I'm not gonna be able to handle them physically one-on-one -on -one. Uh, and so I'm gonna use the threat of that gun to try and gain compliance depending on what we're dealing with so um, I don't think that uh, leads to it so much as just a lack of confidence. There are officers that maybe have a little bit of lack of confidence, so they will jump to tools like a taser or an OC or something like that before just going hands on. Um, it would be great if every officer, uh, you know, was a Wyatt Earp ninja gunfighter and they could shoot, you know, knives out of people's hands and, and hit running legs at 50 yards, but that's just not realistic. Uh, not everybody's going to have the training and not everybody's honestly just going to have the the, the uh, motor skill and physical ability to do some of the things uh, to handle a large aggressive violent uh, offender they're going to need some of these tools at their disposal to help them to gain an advantage so it's a little unrealistic to think that every officer is just going to go out there and be bruce lee and, and be able to to handle it it's not again Hollywood has, has given us this picture of, of what an officer can do remember these are these are regular human people out here uh, performing a very difficult task and we give them the, the training that we can, but not everybody's going to take to that training and be, you know, super good in that area. Uh, we hope that they make good decisions, use the tools and use their backup. Um, but we can't expect all of them to just be able to go hands on with everybody. You're going to have to go to those tools sometimes. Mm -hmm.
So good question though. And I, I would be just for the record, I would be for a physical fitness standard. I think it would be a good thing. Um, and we've talked about it in the department before, but again, you're, you're dealing with um, getting that signed off on with the guild and things like that. Some agencies have it. There's a lot that don't. I'm not against it. Maybe make me go to the gym more. <laughs> okay, so some of the force options that are available starting from, from nothing, starting from no force. First thing that, that we have is our officer presence, sometimes just showing up on scene, uniform put together, uh, looking like you can handle yourself, the way you carry yourself. Uh, sometimes that's enough uh, to, to stop somebody. And sometimes numbers is enough too. We show up with two or three guys, sometimes that's enough where a guy decides or, or a girl uh, decides, hey, um, I'm not gonna fight today, I'm gonna follow the, the commands and, and, and comply. Um, next is verbal commands. We talked about that a little bit, but those a lot of times uh, uh, can can end it right there. And anytime that happens, that's again, a win for everybody. Uh, if those aren't working, uh, some of the other next level up are control techniques uh, that involve pain compliance, controller escort holds, takedowns, uh, and our vascular neck restraint at level one. So I'm just gonna show a couple of ideas on that. So I got Casey here. And we'll scoot back a little bit so you can see kind of both of us. But we talk about uh, some of those level one techniques or, or pain compliance holds. Some of the things, you know, just a simple entry to turn someone and get a hold of them. I may put them in like a, a gooseneck type technique where I'm applying pressure to a joint. And that's just to get him to comply. I might say, hey, go down to your knees. Okay, hey, go put your other hand behind your back. Good, stay right there. And maybe I'm able to go handcuff him there. And if that works and that's all the force that is needed, awesome. You know, easy. It's a low risk, low risk of injury. It hurts him a little bit as I'm doing it. Uh, but if I do a control like that, it's a low risk of, uh, of injury to him. Uh, that's just one example. Um, takedowns, we use a lot of different ideas for, uh, for takedowns. Uh, uh, arm bars are pretty popular amongst both of our deputies. They're, they're simple to do. Uh, arm pull takedowns. Uh, we have some other takedowns that involve you know, uh, guiding the head, things like that. So just, just as an example, again, I've, I've entered in. Maybe I'm just going to do a straight arm bar takedown. I might take him down there and then go into a handcuffing position. It will be nice to Casey today though. So again, that would be you know, a little bit more. I'm getting some resistance and I need to move him to the ground. It's very hard to try to fight with someone and handcuff someone and chase someone to get them in handcuffs as they're standing. So we train that if, if we get resistance and someone is pushing into us or pulling away from them or starting to tense up and get static on us, we want them on the ground. It takes away their strength and it takes away their uh, ability to hurt us as much. So that's that's where we always try to guide them to, um, is to the ground and control them there, okay? And we'll go back to VNR later, thanks Casey, okay? So from there, uh, we, we work into our, our level two stuff, which is our strikes, whether it's fists, elbows, knees, things like that. Again, that's gonna be a little bit more violent attacker, uh, uh, a little bit higher level of force. Um, and again, there's no, there's no rule about what we have to do, we don't have to do one before we can try the other. It's all about what is reasonable in that given situation based on that totality of the circumstances. Because again, officers of different size, different skill levels, different abilities, facing different offenders, certain things aren't gonna work. You know, if I go up against a, you know, a guy that's high on meth, I'm not, I'm not gonna try pain compliance tools. They're just gonna get me injured because I know they don't work. I know from training experience that those people do not feel pain when they're in that state. So those are not techniques that are gonna work. I'm going to use something that's going to be uh, still reasonable, but have a, a better chance of working uh, and not getting me hurt. And then we already talked about uh, in that same category, OC and the taser and the impact weapons. <clears throat> so here's an example of, of just an officer using just some regular force techniques. There's no sound with this one. And you'll see him, he's able to take him to the ground with a couple of strikes there after he squared up to him. And he'll start to try and get back up again. So he'll use another strike to the ribs, one there, and then try to get him back. And then we'll have a citizen that'll come over here to, to try and assist. Okay. And so that, to, to me, as a use of force instructor, I would, I would look at that and think that was a reasonable use of force. Uh, it, it doesn't look pretty. It's not nice. 
Uh, but our use of force, again, we're overcoming resistance. So when you have a, an offender that is pulling away from you, and again, we're watching a short video clip. We don't know what he was arrested for, what is the history, uh, but we have a guy that hasn't been searched, frisked, or anything like that. Uh, we have another person in the car that the officer is trying to keep eyes on at the same time. He's in a he's in an area where other you know vehicles are moving around and stuff like that. So not an area where he wants to roll around on the ground and be wrestling around for for uh, a length of time. Uh, so he's going to use a force option that ends this fight pretty quickly, uh, but it's still reasonable. And so when you have the guy and he turns and he squares up to you, there's no there's no requirement and it doesn't make sense to wait for him to throw a strike at you. That officer is going to overcome that. Uh, with a, just a couple of nice well-placed strikes uh, and then take him into custody there. So, Here's another example. This is a this this one is an example of uh, some more ground technique being used and this is some of the we we do do some ground training in this area. Go ahead. All right, hang on. Sir. After getting kicked out of the club for assault, suspects of Kansas City police officer, the officer, officer Jared, stuck under double legs, neon belt, stands for additional all while holding his back and left hand, north neon chest, just by the head, 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 notifies partner that he's back under control, smooth cuffing transition, a GST classic, transitions back to an elbow hug armbar, switch back to north neon chest, calm communication with dispatch, manage the distance with the female spectator, once his partner's ready, elbow cup, arm drag to front headlock, figure four leg entanglement exactly as taught in GST, Kimura pain compliance, second hand extraction, cuffed and done, not a single punch thrown. Okay, so there's an example where that's an officer with some, some good training and good ground training specifically in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, we have several of our instructors that are, are pretty well versed in that area. Um, that's an example of being able to get it done just with some of those control pain compliance uh, and, and leverage techniques. Uh, and again, you see him immediately, as soon as he had resistance and the guy was pushing into him, immediately goes to take him down to the ground because then he can control him better there. Uh, really hectic, chaotic situation in that one. A lot of people around, a lot of uh, things that could, outside things that could hurt you or, or cause you to not be able to do your job. And so that officer does a good job of, of maintaining composure and control. Um, again, if, if, if every officer was that, that skilled, that would be wonderful, but that's just not a, a, a realistic uh, idea of what's, of what's going to happen or what occurs. Not everybody is going to be training, you know, hours a day in the jiu-jitsu gym like that officer. Um, but we're always going to work towards that in our training. It's much of learning from stuff like this and trying to uh, put in as much of that as we can into our programs. So. After getting okay. All right, so we'll move into deadly force. So I'm sure there'll probably be some, some questions here in this area. So deadly force options. So these are options where uh, if, if an officer thought that, that their, their life or somebody else was at risk of death or serious bodily injury, they could do uh, one of these things as an option to stop that. Uh, at the same time, if one of these things was happening to one of our, our officers, they could respond in like with, with deadly force. Uh, impact weapons to the head or spine intentionally. So if we take that baton that we had earlier and I'm intentionally trying to hit somebody in the head uh, or in the upper spine area here, those are gonna be looked at as a use of deadly force because they can cause a, a serious uh, injury to the head, definitely have a, a likelihood of causing a concussion. So not necessarily are they gonna cause death, but they're gonna cause a serious bodily injury uh, as defined by the uh, state and Supreme Court. Um, choke holds that, that cut off the airway, so anything that interrupts airflow. Uh, and that uh, was again laid out in, the, in the, a recent federal mandate. Uh, those have been banned for uh, at a less than deadly force level for, for years and years and years at the Sheriff's Department. Uh, walk far longer than, than I've been here. Uh, we have not been using those for anything less than deadly force. So, but if you're, if you're, if you're at risk of death or serious bodily injury, you could then do something that obstructed air. Um, other than that, you cannot. Uh, firearms, that one is, most people think of that one when they think of deadly force options. Uh, knives, all our deputies carry, carry knives. We do use them as tools sometimes for you know, <coughs> cutting seat belts and other things like that. Uh, digging bullet fragments out of a wall when you're on an investigation, something like that. But they are also designed as a defensive tool should their life be uh, in, in jeopardy. Um, the vehicle that we drive, that can be a deadly force tool if need be, if we ram someone. Uh, now there's a big difference between a pit at a reasonable low speed 
where we take, line up our car uh, on the back court of another car and turn it. That's an intentional trained move that happens only at certain speeds that has a very low risk of causing injury. Um, that we can do at less than deadly force, but if we're actually taking our car and ramming it to the back or side uh, of another vehicle, that's gonna be a deadly force technique. Um, and then less lethal tools or less lethal or beanbag uh, rounds, out either out of a shotgun or out of a, um, uh, an M M40. Any of those that are intentionally to the head, spine, or thorax, those would be deadly force. Those are carried only currently only by special members of some of the SWAT team uh, and a couple other units. So those aren't readily available in patrol, some of those less lethal tools. We have a few here and there, uh, but they're, they're guys that work special units and then have them with them when they're in patrol. So, so here's your deadly force threshold. Again, objective and reasonable belief, okay, that your life or safety or another is in actual or imminent danger of death or serious physical injury. Again, based on the totality of the circumstances known to the officer at the time of the response, right? So death or serious physical injury. Um, serious physical injury, according to the Supreme Court and, and under, under state law is a few things. It's concussive blows to the head, lacerations that require suturing, cutting off the airway, uh, any temporary or permanent disfigurement, uh, temporary or permanent loss of a bodily function. Uh, any of those things, uh, broken bones would be the last one. Any of those would be ser considered a serious physical or as the Supreme Court puts it, serious bodily injury. So here's an example. Now, this next one, if you if you're this one does have a shooting in it, it's not graphic, but you'll hear it. And I'll lay it out before I go there. So what you're gonna see is let's see if this plays on there. But yeah. Okay, so away from the play. Yeah. So what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a, a, an officer that has a subject uh, down on the ground that he's trying to uh, take into custody. Uh, and there's an article that you can read that goes with this one. But this happened in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, the subject on the ground that you'll see in the white shirt is an off-duty firefighter. Uh, it's a pretty unfortunate incident, but it, it's a good example of, uh, you know, how something can turn bad, you know, pretty quick. Um, he has just gotten married, uh, the firefighter, at the wedding, they're at the reception. The, uh, his new brother-in-law gets uh, very intoxicated, so they call a cab to come pick him up. The cab driver comes. They go to put him in the, in the car. They put him in there, and then there's a dispute over the fare. Uh, during the argument, the cab driver says something disparaging to the firefighter's new bride. Uh, and so he takes offense to that, gets in a fight with the cab driver and, and beats him up. Uh, call goes out, he takes off running from there. The officer that you'll see was actually working nearby at an off-duty job, uh, heard the call come out, uh, sees the firefighter, ends up chasing him. So he's chased him a few blocks before we get to where we're at now. So I'll go ahead and play the video there. I know. I do not agree whatsoever. I don't either. That's why I'm videotaping this. That's a very aggressive stance that Cobb is taking. Okay, I have to intervene. No, don't. Please. We're just getting it on video. It'll be okay. What did he do? Hey, don't fight the cop. Don't fight don't the cop. Fight it's not going to fight. Oh, oh, sh So he ends up uh, shooting shooting twice in the in the chest, and, and unfortunately, the firefighter there uh, did die. So you can see how quickly uh, just an officer trying to take someone into custody there uh, can escalate to the point where the officer was pinned down on the ground and taking shots to the head uh, as he's punched there. Um, I can tell you from experience uh, as a, as an amateur boxer uh, and getting nearly not unconscious standing up. It doesn't take very many of those, especially when your head is pinned to the ground and it has no place to retract uh, before you're going to be knocked unconscious. 
And of course, every every fight that we are in, uh, there's a gun involved. It's on our hip. And so that's always a concern that if we get knocked unconscious or, or put out of the fight, that's accessible uh, to that person as well. And again, we don't we don't have to go home. It's not uh, expected that we go home with, you know, our, our eye sockets broken and, and, and concussions and things like that. The officer in that actually suffered uh, a broken orbital bone. He has permanent some permanent paralysis on one side of his body. Um, and there was a nurse that was nearby that was on scene, fortunately, that came up to him and said, hey, you need to go to the hospital. And fortunately, he did because he had some hemorrhaging in the brain. Uh, so he had to go to the hospital and get that taken care of. Uh, so not necessarily a situation that you would think of as far as, you know, at risk of, of death, but definitely at risk of a serious bodily injury and potentially death as he's getting his head uh, pounded into the, the pavement there. So an unfortunate situation, but um, again, things can happen really, really fast and, and, and uh, get scary in a hurry. Was there another one? No, oh. Okay, so deadly force, uh, you'll hear the term lethal force. Some people will use the term lethal force uh, and when we throw that around, non-lethal, less lethal, this or that. And technically, the, the two are not interchangeable. Um, deadly force is not synonymous with lethal force. The, the two differ mostly by in the intent. If I use deadly force, my intent in using deadly force is always to stop someone. Uh, you've probably heard somewhere along the line, you've heard that somebody say, or some, you probably saw somebody comment on the internet somewhere where people say, uh, when officers shoot someone, they shoot to kill them. Uh, you can comment in the chat if you've ever heard that. I'm sure some of you have. That is not the case. That is not why we shoot people. We shoot someone to stop a threat. Someone has created a, a risk of death or serious bodily injury to us or someone else, and we are shooting to stop that threat. Once the threat is stopped, then we are to stop shooting. Um, and then make it safe and go into now life-saving mode um, and do whatever we can to start helping that person that we just had to use force against. Um, lethal force, your intent would be to kill someone. Um, you're intentionally trying to kill someone. That that does exist. Uh, the military still uses lethal force where we go in and intentionally take out targets and with the intent of, of eradicating that target. Um, and it still exists uh, in the prison system in the form of, you know, a lethal injection. You know, someone sentenced to death and it goes all the way through and they do that. So, um, but again, we don't, we're not attacking, killing, or assaulting. We're, we're using deadly force. We're apprehending, stopping, or responding. Um, even when using deadly force, the intent is always to save a life or lives, either ours or somebody else. Okay. The suspect's behavior generated sufficient fear <clears throat> because you believe that deadly force was reasonable in defense of life. That is the, that is the threshold for using that, that deadly force. Um, most times when people say lethal force, I know what they're talking about, but again, they're not, not necessarily the same. The intent is different. Question. Okay. In the previous video that you showed, the one where they were making the traffic stop and he was punching to the head. The officer. The, video, the officer was. Yes. Okay. From the officer was considered acceptable force, but punches to the head of an officer is considered deadly force justification. Can you go through the differences? I think what maybe. Sure. Should... Yeah. And, uh, and so, so, so no, they're not. Uh, it's not the same. So the, the first video, what you saw was uh, two. Uh, and again, that that video is not from Washington State, so I'll I'll just we'll just kind of assume that something like that would happen here in our state and in the Ninth Circuit, where intermediate force is specifically defined. Because again, that's not something that's defined nationwide, uh, but specifically to our area, um, the punches, the strikes are going to be intermediate force, depending on the reasonable risk of some kind of, of serious injury. Um, if you look at that first video where two, two grown men are standing of fairly equal size and I deliver the one or two strikes to the face where the head has room to retract and stuff like that, that is a much lower risk for a concussion or a serious injury. You take that now. If, now, if that officer were to take that guy and pin his head to the ground and, and then start wailing away like we saw in the other video, then yes, that officer would, would be probably delivering what we would categorize as deadly force. Uh, and he better be justified in using deadly force at that at that point, or, or at the very least, intermediate force, um, depending on, you know, how many and what he's doing there. So not quite the same when we look at those two situations. It's, and I can tell you, again, this is from my experience as, as in boxing and in defensive tactics as a trainer, there is far greater risk. I also train MMA for about four or five years, so I, I've been punched with my head on the ground. <laughs> there is a, if you couldn't tell, there's a far greater risk of being hit in that position where your head has nowhere to retract and help you absorb the blow 
as opposed to your head being pinned to the cement. It's almost like getting hit twice because you're getting hit and then the back of your head is also hitting the cement um, behind you. So it's a much uh, greater risk in, in that second video that you saw. So not quite the same. Um, does that, does that cover it? I, I think so. I'll, yeah. um, she'll let me know if they... If you have a, if you have a follow-up to that, yeah. that, that'd be great. But So a little, little bit different. Uh, and again, remember the officers were, were overcoming resistance. Um, we, we talk about, you know, that second video, he's, he's getting punched in the head in a position that's likely going to cause some, some damage and a concussion and, and some serious injuries to his head and brain and, and face. Um, he's not, he's not required to respond with an equal level of force. He's able to go uh, above that to stop that, that threat, which is what, what he did. So, <laughs> Okay, and real quick, I'll cover it because I said it would, I, I thought the slide was in here, but that's right, I don't, we don't need the slide. So the case that covers uh, use of deadly force, when we have a use of deadly force, we look at two cases. Number one, we look at, we look. We still look at the Graham reasonable standard that we talked about earlier. So the force still has to be reasonable based on the totality of the circumstances. And then we also look at a case called Tennessee v. Gardner from, from the 80s. Uh, this is a case out of Tennessee, as you can tell by the name, uh, where they shot a fleeing uh, criminal. Uh, this was a case of a 15-year-old kid. Uh, eight, the age of the kid wasn't known to the officer at the time, but uh, that's a fact. He was 15 years old, had burglarized a home, uh, and then was fleeing from that burglary. So at that point, it's just a property crime. Uh, as he's running to get away, uh, goes to climb a fence, the officer is not able to catch up to him, draws his weapon, uh, fires around, hits him in the head, and kills him as, as he's trying to climb the fence. Uh, at the time that happened, believe it or not, I think it was 1985, at the time that happened, that was actually within the law in this country. Uh, and it dates back to old common law, where the, in common law, in old English common law, the penalty for a felony was death. So under that system, it made sense. If they catch you, they're going to kill you anyway, so you should be allowed to use that kind of force on someone that, that's fleeing. Jump forward to 1985, that, that really doesn't make a lot of sense, because again, now you're dealing with just a property crime. Um, so the court realized in looking at that case that we need to fix something here. This is not a proportionate response for someone that just committed a property crime to shoot them as they're fleeing uh, and potentially kill them or kill them as they did in that case. Uh, it always amazes me that it took us till 1985 to figure that out because that seems pretty common sense. But um, they did finally figure it out. So that officer uh, wouldn't have been charged and wasn't charged in that case because he acted under that current law. But anything going forward would fall under now the new standard or the new you know, bright line rule. Uh, and what that rule established was if you were going to shoot someone that was fleeing, number one, you had to have probable cause. Uh, so not just reasonable suspicion. It had to be enough where if you caught that person, you would arrest them. Probable cause to believe they committed a crime of extreme violence or threatened violence. Um, so, again, not just the property crime. It's got to be something uh, a lot more violent uh, that involves that. Um, they have to be either believed to be armed or you have other justification to show that they present an imminent risk of death or serious bodily injury to other officers or the public if they're not apprehended. And that, that's the case that also established that warnings before shootings. If feasible, you have to give uh, the warning before shooting. And that's the Tennessee v. Gardner case that established that. So. Okay. Any questions on deadly force before I jump forward? Because I know that's a hot topic for a lot of folks. And it is a big deal. And it's anytime we use uh, any kind of deadly force within the sheriff's department or any in the agencies around here, it is heavily investigated. Um, prior to uh, 940, uh, what we had was a, a co-investigation with the prosecutor's office. So we would do, we would have our officer involved shooting team come out. They would do an investigation, and then the prosecutor's office would send their own team to do a separate uh, investigation uh, along with that. So we had an independent uh, agency coming in and, and verifying that we were doing a correct interview and doing their own as well. Uh, with 940, that's changed, um, and currently we have several teams uh, around the state that will do a complete independent investigation. So if we have a shooting, uh, one of the other regional teams, non not from Pierce County, would come in and do their independent investigation of that shooting. Um, those officers that are being investigated, they would be put on an administrative leave. Uh, usually it's it's a week uh, that they're put on leave. They go 
out for seven days. They have to do a few things before they can, can come back and, and show that they're mentally fit to come back. And, and, and uh, we've had times where, you know, officers have asked for an extra week or something like that. If there's a real intense situation, they do have that option, but generally it's about a week uh, before they can come back. Okay, moving forward. So excessive force. So excessive force is force that's not justified in light of the circumstances. There's a couple of definitions here that I've got on here. Uh, anytime an officer uses force after an offender's resistance has ceased. Okay, so once we've got compliance and they stop resisting, we stop using force. Uh, anytime an LEO uses deadly force when only intermediate or non-deadly force or no force was justified. So again, we've jumped to a level of force that's too high for the given situation. Okay. And same thing here, intermediate, when maybe only non-deadly or nothing was, was used. And then anytime we perform a Fourth Amendment seizure without legal justification. So if I just go stop somebody for the sake of stopping them and I have no reasonable suspicion of a crime, and I, but I force them to stay there and talk to me or stop, that is a unlawful seizure and that is a Fourth Amendment issue and that is considered excessive force. And doesn't, you know, think of that when you think of excessive force, you think more of, you know, an actual physical act, but that can also be an excessive force as a Fourth Amendment issue. Okay. All right, so we're gonna watch a video here. So this is one where, uh, like I said, always there's more to the story with these videos. I, I've researched this one a little bit to, to, to try and find out what happened post uh, incident. But this is one where when I watch it, I'm clear in my mind that this would be uh, an excessive force. And I, I've labeled it such on the slide. So, But you, you can make your own opinion, uh, I think, and, and see what you think. But to me, this is an excessive force incident. So this is a person that's already in custody in the backseat of a police car. And you'll see him tap in the window. And if the audio is not loud enough for you, what he's trying to do is trying to get the attention of the officer um, because he has to go to the bathroom. So watch what happens here uh, with this. It's actually a sergeant that comes up and interacts with him. So. And this is in Milwaukee in 2010. You know what I'm saying? I told you to stop. Check in the window. You hear me? Okay. So, and, and you can kind of, if you want to put your own opinion in the in the chat there, but that's one that I, I look at, and I don't need a whole lot more to tell me that that is a, a case of excessive force. Um, I don't see any resistance from the suspect. I don't see any reason for the force. I mean, when we're when we're using force, we're we're stopping a threat, or we're getting someone to you know get into a car or move to a position, taking someone into custody. We we have a reason. We have a lawful purpose behind that force. There's really no lawful purpose other than that he's just upset with the kid because he's tapping his foot on the window and being mouthy. Now, there are times when when we've had suspects try to kick our windows out uh, and the, the windows on a patrol car. Uh, I don't think I'm giving any way, secrets away here. They're not that hard to kick out. Uh, we've had you know, some pretty small folks rear back and kick out a window. Um, and so that can be something to consider when someone's pushing their foot, uh, but not necessarily just a light tap. You know, this may be a situation where you go over and see what is what is he doing and make sure he's not doing that. Uh, but it's certainly not somewhere you're going to haul off and start striking him there. Uh, this is one when I show I show this one to our, our new hires and we talk about this one and I always put them in the position of, OK, if you were the uh, chief of this department, you know, what what would you do if this was given to you and, and what decisions would you make? And it, and it ranges because they don't know how things work. Um, and then I always put them in a position of, OK, now you're the prosecutor. Would you file charges against this officer? Now you're the, the jury. What would you decide? Now you're the judge. What would you sentence? And the um, the answers are always a little bit different and range anywhere from, you know, fire him to 
charge him to maybe give him probation and things like that. Uh, and what's what's uh, the, the fact of what actually happened, and this kind of shows you what happens if you overstep your bounds, you know, within within the confines of this job. This was a sergeant. He had no he had an exemplary record up to this incident. He had no previous uh, excessive force incidents or anything like that. A pretty good record. Uh, he was a vet. Uh, he had uh, claimed to have some some uh, PTSD, uh, which is, is probably true, but still doesn't justify what he did here. Uh, but he was fired from his agency almost immediately. Uh, he was charged. He was charged with an assault, and then he was charged with an abuse of his powers. Um, and he was actually found, uh, he pled no contest, but he was convicted uh, uh, and sentenced and served 18 months in federal prison. Um, this is a this is a where, an example of uh, what we would classify as a, a misdemeanor assault. So if this was citizen on citizen, this would be a misdemeanor fourth degree assault. And the punishment that would normally be seen from that can range from, you know, nothing if the victim doesn't cooperate, all the way up to maybe just some probation or maybe a little bit of jail time. Um, but definitely not 18 months in, in federal prison. Uh, but because of his position of authority, uh, he was held to a higher standard and given a, a, a higher punishment, which which he should. So. Uh, and kind of along the lines of what you're chatting about, um, if, an, if that incident took place in Pierce County, what would happen to the officer? Great question. So if, if that uh, took place in Pierce County, uh, immediately we would start an investigation. Uh, anytime there's a complaint uh, that comes in, whether it's from, a citizen. It could be from another deputy. It could be me as a sergeant. I could I could put in a complaint, send it to our IA. Uh, our internal affairs unit will get that, and they would start a full investigation on it. In this case like this, the deputy would would be put on uh, an administrative leave while the investigation is going on. They wouldn't be allowed to come back to work until it was finished. Um, so they would be on leave while that was going on. It would be investigated at multiple layers. Most complaints, a simple complaint that a citizen calls in, it starts off being handled by a, at the sergeant level where a sergeant will start to review it. He doesn't necessarily make the finding, but he just gives a recommendation. So he'll do some investigation, give a recommendation. Something like this where it involves excessive force, um, sexual harassment, discrimination, anything like that where it's much more serious, those are going to be investigated specifically by our internal affairs uh, investigators. So we have detectives in that unit uh, and they'll interview everyone involved, they'll do tape statements with everyone involved and try to get down to the, the truth of what happened there. Uh, and they'll make a recommendation, it'll go up the chain all the way to the sheriff who'll make the final decision. And it could be, again, anything up to, at, the, at the department level, anything up to and including termination. Uh, whether or not the officer gets charged, that will be an investigation that's done by the prosecutor's office, and, and they will. Um, we've had some incidents uh, where officers have done some things, and we've brought in out, outside agencies to investigate, again, just to show that you know we're being transparent and, and we're having them do that. So on a, a, something that was a real serious nature, that is always an option too. And I don't work for internal affairs, so I don't want to speak too much about how they do their business because um, I'm not the expert on it, but I've, I've seen uh, kind of how that then works and kind of the basic overview of how it works. Okay. Okay, so excessive force. So all officers, and this is per policy and this is per law, and this goes all the way back to a case for, uh, called Yang v. Hardin where this was established and uh, what you had to do was established, but any law enforcement officer present and observing another law enforcement officer using force that is clearly beyond that is which is objectively reasonable shall, when in a position to do so, intercede to prevent the use of such excessive force. So we have a duty to intercede. Uh, that's not new. We've had that. We've always had that. Um, what we're required to do uh, from that Yang v. Harding case is, A, you've got to strongly caution the officer. Uh, if that doesn't work, you can physically restrain the officer if that's feasible. Um, and either way, you've got to immediately report that incident without delay. And that means as soon as you get clear of that call and you're able to, you get to your supervisor and you report what you saw. And then that whole chain of events uh, starts, like I just described, as it goes to IA and starts to get investigated. Um, so if, you're, if you fail to intervene uh, in any of these situations, excessive force, uh, unjustifiable arrest, constitutional violation, and it's determined that you had a reasonable opportunity to prevent harm from occurring, you can be charged uh, with failing to intervene. And you can also be charged in, in connection with that uh, particular crime, such as uh, the George Floyd case that is currently ongoing. We've all seen that one. Um, there's other officers charged along with uh, uh, the, the officer that was uh, had the knee on, uh, what's his name? Derek Sh Shaw Chauvin. Chauviner. Uh, there's other officers being charged with him 
uh, for the same crimes because they they failed to intervene. So in other, in other words, they aided him in doing what he was doing. Um, so let's see. Good. Okay. So moving on, there's the last little section here, and then we have just one more demonstration uh, with the taser and, and with the next right here. So we do use uh, in the sheriff's department again, like I said earlier, choke holds are banned. They're a use of deadly force only uh, to actually cut off someone's airway. We do have a technique that we have used since 1998 and had great success with, and that's called the vascular neck restraint. It is a non-deadly uh, uh, or intermediate force technique. There's two ways to use it. One way of using it is non-deadly, and the other way when we actually start compressing is considered uh, in the Ninth Circuit as an intermediate force. Uh, it is not considered deadly force by any court, uh, whether local, district, or, or federal level. Um, so you have two different types of, of, of what we would call choke holds or holds around the neck. Uh, first of all, the term choke is kind of fallacious anyways. To, to choke means an internal obstruction of, of your throat. So we're not actually shoving down anything down anyone's throat. Uh, what we're really talking about when we're talking about a choke hold that you see in, in, in the media or you hear this term is a strangle uh, where something's cr uh, blocking off the airway or, 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 or pressing into the uh, trachea and causing you to not be able to breathe. Uh, that, if you're doing that, that is considered deadly force. Again, it, it can be used, uh, but only at a, a deadly force threshold. Uh, it is still used in the military as, as well. The vascular neck restraint that we're talking about is, is a different uh, method uh, of compression where we're compressing bilaterally on the sides of the neck to compress the carotid arteries, the jugular veins get compression, so does the carotid sinus, which is just all the carotid sinus is, is where your carotid artery comes up and splits into two. There's a little bulb there, and that's called the carotid sinus. When we do this technique, there's no airway compression, so there's no lateral uh, front-to-back compression coming into the trachea. The person can breathe the entire time. Uh, there's still uh, air coming in, which means there's still oxygenated blood flow in the body. So as soon as the technique is released, they have still have fresh oxygen supply in their, in their body. Uh, there's no forcible neck manipulation, and it's not classified as deadly force. Um, so again, this is the, the side of your neck, what it looks like. The red lines coming up, those are your carotid arteries. And you can see they're kind of protected by your, your neck muscles there. The blue would be your veins. Um, the pressure is applied to those those carotid arteries just above where the, uh, the muscle stops there to try to get pressure to those arteries. It doesn't take very much to use this technique. It only takes about seven pounds of pressure in that spot, what we call the carotid triangle, uh, to uh, if you had to render someone unconscious. Um, and it only takes about four to seven seconds of applying pressure in that spot um, to render someone unconscious uh, should you have to, okay? Now, the goal of a neck restraint is not to render someone unconscious. That's never the goal. The goal, just like any other control hold, which it is classified as a control hold, is to gain compliance. If we have to put someone in this technique, we're using verbal commands, telling them to comply. If they comply, then there's no compression at all. We don't even, we don't even press the sides of the neck. Uh, they go down into a position for handcuffing, and it's over. If they continue to fight, uh, push into us, pull away, try to resist, uh, kick, spit, whatever they're doing, um, then we have the option to compress. If we start to compress and they, they, they give up, they say, okay, okay, then we stop compressing. Again, they go back down to the ground into handcuffs. So we can de-escalate any time during the use of this technique. Uh, the only time they would go unconscious is if they continue to fight and it goes on for that four to seven seconds, then they may fall temporarily unconscious. Um, the unconsciousness, they're out for a few seconds while we get them rolled into a handcuffing position and then they wake up just fine. Um, I've been put out unconscious with this technique probably a hundred times uh, in training. It is, it is certainly safe. And we'll talk about some of the studies that show the safety of it. But first, I'm just going to demonstrate a little bit with Casey here so you can see it. So I'll just do it from the, the rear approach here. So a, a level one neck restraint just involves me taking Casey, reaching around, and finding this position here. Okay? From this position, I can take him. If he doesn't, if he doesn't fight me, he doesn't resist. He says, "Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to comply." I can sit him down to his butt, go down to his butt, down the ground. Okay, okay, and then I can take him over to a handcuffing position, roll on your stomach. Okay, and we can handcuff him there. We don't have to even compress. Um, if he continues to to resist, then I can compress here 
to try to gain compliance. Again, if he if he complies, uh, then I'll, I'll really release that pressure and go back down to that same position. I'm gonna have Casey sit for the next part of this so it's a little more comfortable on his back. And this will be the last one. So, but again, from here, as I make this, the chin and elbow are always in, a, in alignment with each other, which creates a, a pocket for the trachea. And there's never any this pressure here or this pressure here, like a chokehold would be, or a stranglehold. There's only pressure side to side here. So as I compress, Casey can breathe. I'm gonna take a big deep breath. And out and in and out. So he can breathe and he gets airflow the entire time from that, okay? I create a, what we call a C collar with either my head, can also be done with the forearm where I, I clamp his head in position to avoid injuries to the neck as we're doing that technique. So thank you, Casey. Okay. And we'll finish it. We're almost out of time right You're good. Okay. So for that technique, uh, this is what the, the State Academy and the National Law Enforcement Training Center recommend and what we uh, comply with. Uh, instructors require a 24-hour certification, so they go to a three-day uh, intensive course of how to, how to teach the technique, how to do the technique, how to make sure it's safe. Your users, um, and excuse me, they get an eight-hour recertification every three years, and actually we go above that. Our guys get about eight hours every year. Basic users get a, an eight-hour full-day uh, certification, just how to apply the basic technique. And then they do a four-hour recertification every year uh, on that. Um, this is a technique we, we monitor quite a bit. Uh, and recently, last year, we undertook a study to kind of look at our VNR numbers. We did this before uh, any of this current uh, social unrest and some of these incidents happened. We did this uh, in conjunction with something that FIRE was looking at as far as how they were going to respond when, we, when we, they came out for these techniques, uh, if, if they were used. But anyways, the numbers from 2016 to 2019, so this represents a four-year study. There were 330 vascular neck restraint applications used within Pierce County. So that covers all of uh, our Central Patrol Districts and all of our um, University Place, Edgewood, all our detachments. Um, the total that had to be rendered unconscious was 155, so under 50%. So more than 50% just by being put in the technique, gave up, no more fighting. They were taken into custody without further incident. Um, total injuries in any of those incidents, there was 54, which represents 16%. None of those injuries could be attributed to the VNR or, or the application of the VNR itself. And these, to, in order to do this study, we went, we went through every every case that, that cited injury. We went and read the report to see what the injury was and where it came from. Um, 80 people were taken to the hospital out of those 330. None of those were taken to the hospital for relation, reasons related to the VNR. And I'll show you a, a chart in a second of what, what those reasons would be. Okay, question? One question is, are there other options that can replace the VNR? Sure. I mean, you have other other techniques. Uh, there's there's really not a, any other technique that uh, I can think of that can end a fight as quickly as a vascular neck restraint. Uh, and it can be as effective for a smaller officer. It's a big equalizer in a use of force situation for a smaller officer. Um, it's hard to control someone, you know, especially someone like Casey's size, to try to control his whole body. But if I control just his head, that gives me control over his direction and, and the ability to take him to the ground. So it's a big game changer for our smaller officers. Uh, there are other options, you know, I could use <laughs> because we talked about already that, that when I compress, that's an intermediate force level technique, okay? So think about your other intermediate force tool. My other options would be spray him with, with that nasty pepper spray, hit him with that stick, hit him with that the taser. So those are other options that are in that category. So if we look at level playing field of all your intermediate force tools, VNR is the safest, least painful, and quickest way to get someone into custody, So it, which is why we use it so much. Um, I'm not cleaning up OC and the guy's not burning for 30 minutes after. I'm not taking him to the hospital to get stitches for as the, you know, that the impact weapon caused. I'm not pulling taser probes out and trying to put his teeth back in that he lost when he fell to the ground. So it is a, is a great tool for us that can seriously end a fight quickly. Then this is from an old FBI study and I don't have the numbers in this slide here, but the, the longer a fight goes, the higher the chances of injury to either, either us or the suspect. So if I can take Casey and get a hold of him in this VNR and end the, end the fight in 10 seconds, that's awesome. He's not getting hurt, I'm not getting hurt. If I have to fight him longer and go through a multitude of tools and use strikes and try to 
drive them to the ground and and use you know arm cranks and things like that and it goes on for a minute two minutes we're just looking at further escalating and a lot of times that's going to result in now maybe this fight that i could have ended in 10 seconds with a bnr is now lasting two minutes and now the suspect gets the advantage over me and now i have to use deadly force to end it um specifically and i've, I've said this at another presentation but those of you that are familiar with the richard brooks case in atlanta if you look at the video on that one that one's still ongoing obviously if you haven't seen that one you can look it up but that's the one where um, the officer gets his taser taken from him and then as he's running uh, the suspect turns around and, and fires the, the taser you can see the wires come out and everything on, on one of the camera views that's an incident where if you watch the as I watched the first part of that incident they actually had him on the ground uh, and he's kind of in a seated position and there's an officer right behind him in a perfect position and I, I don't believe they have a VNR as a tool there in Atlanta uh, at their disposal, but he would have been in a, a perfect position to apply a VNR right there, and that fight would have been over. So if that same incident happened here in Pierce County, you know, one of our deputies and could have applied a VNR right there, ended it, everybody goes home safe and alive. So, well, one guy goes to jail for a little bit, but then goes home. So, and so def, definitely a, a kind of an unmatched tool when we talk about comparing it to other intermediate force tools and its, its effectiveness. Every year, the effectiveness numbers for the VNR are right in the mid to high 90s. So, um, so here's, here's the uh, injuries. Again, 84% of the cases had no injuries. 16% there was injuries reported with, again, uh, for this four-year study with zero uh, injuries reported. And the reason we picked these four years is because 2016 is when we started using that blue team system that I mentioned earlier. So it's it's an easy system for me to be able to pull the, the data from. Before that, we had a system for tracking use of force, but most of it was on paper that was filled out and sent and printed and filed. So we'd have to we'd have to pay a lot of people a lot of time to go dig into the file cabinets and pull them out. So, uh, but I'm sure I'm certain the numbers would be similar. It's a pretty good sample size. Uh, the injuries that did occur, some of those uh, were from strikes that preceded the, the VNR or, or uh, a takedown that preceded it, taser probes. Those, those aren't necessarily big injuries, but they do cause a little puncture in the body, so we put those in there as injuries. Scrapes from ground scuffle. Four people had self-inflicted, I uh, mean, they, they cut themselves prior to uh, police contact, so they, they had an injury, but it wasn't from the, the use of force. Canine contacts. Uh, there was one joint injury. One person complained of had a complaint of pain that was his injury but it, it was non non not in any area that would have been attributed to the vnr and then one injury from the uh impact weapons and then some of the reasons people might have gone to the hospital in some of these cases some of them were dog bites if somebody gets bit by one of our canine dogs they have to go to the hospital before jail uh duis they go to get a blood draw uh, mental health involves on some of these as well but none of them were concerns related to a neck restraint or any effects from that so Pretty good numbers when we look at a four-year study of how safe the technique was for us. So um, the study itself, or the technique itself, has been studied multiple times, um, even dating back to the 40s. They they studied uh, the effects of, of blocking carotid artery blood flow uh, in the Ross and Cabot and Anderson study. That um, was a study done by the Navy, and they studied that for up to 100 seconds. They cut off carotid blood flow uh, on using a sample size of 132 uh, people. Uh, and cutting it off multiple times, long periods of times, and they were able to cut it off for up to 100 seconds uh, with no ill effects at all uh, in that study. So the, the four to seven seconds that we're going to be cutting off that carotid blood flow uh, is not going to harm anybody. We train our deputies that 10 to 15 seconds, if, if, if you're having to squeeze and it's not working, go to something else. We do that with all of our tools. If it's not working, you transition to something else that, that might work. So either you're doing it wrong or it's just you know, there are some people that have a pretty good buildup of, of musculature in the size of the neck and just their carotids are embedded a little bit deeper and, and those folks are, are not going to feel the effects as much. Um, I've come across a, a couple of those folks, but um, just like anything else, we'd say go try something else because it's not working. So. so I didn't have a question, but I, are you wrapping up? Yes, just about. One thing I wanted to make sure you hit, which I don't know if you did, maybe you did and I missed it, was about shooting in the leg. Oh, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. I, Thought about that on this. So, so shooting like, and that, that question comes up at, at every community academy I've ever presented that, and it, it, it's out there. Um, so, when you look at, at shooting uh, a stationary target, if the, if the target was just stationary and standing there, there is there is a possibility we could we could try to aim and shoot at the lake. 
Um, again, remember if I shoot the leg, unless I just, my round uh, goes in and we, most of us carry a nine millimeter round, unless my round just goes in and completely shatters the, the femur uh, and, 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 uh, and stops him from being able to stand, that person is still gonna be able to move and run and attack and things like that. But the reason we don't do that is because under stress in a shooting, the odds of you hitting a target that small, stationary or moving are, are very slim, uh, especially if it's moving. Um, I have been in a shooting, uh, and when I was in a shooting, I was, I was firing on a guy that uh, was charging, uh, had already cut uh, one deputy, got her across the jumpsuit here, and was charging down the stairs towards another deputy carrying his knife and another big screwdriver in his hand. Uh, and so when I fired on that guy, there was no way, uh, even mentally, that I would, would have been able to think of, oh, I'm going to shoot him in the leg. And, and this will be great because it's you go into that fight or flight mode, your adrenaline kicks in and all you're doing is reverting to training. And you, when you revert to training, I say this all the time when we're, we're training, uh, you revert to your lowest level of training. You're not going to all of a sudden be able to pull off that one, that one time when you were able to hit that target for 50 yards, you're going to do what you, what your normal baseline is for your training. That's what you're going to be able to do under stress and under that stress with, with everything going on, the odds of you hitting such a small moving target are, are almost zero. Uh, so we train to hit, we train to target center mass because that is the, the biggest target that is presented to us. That's the highest likelihood that we're gonna hit the target and hopefully stop it. Um, so I remember when my shooting, all the guy had no shirt on. So all I remember was just seeing that the weapons in his hands and then charging where my partner was at and then seeing just a, you know, a, a peach colored torso. And that's what I was aiming at. I wasn't thinking about a particular body part, I was just thinking I have to get some uh, rounds on this guy to stop him so he doesn't doesn't kill my partner. Um, and then, then I'll go check on the partner that he already cut. So um, there's no way under under that kind of stress that you're going to be able to think of hitting and be able to hit a target that small. So, yeah, and I think also Hollywood, again, ha has yes. sort of presented us yes. with this image. In one hour, you watch the show and everybody that is bad gets shot one time yep. and they're on the ground. So the stopping the threat again, that, that it does require um, mold, you know, yeah. stopping the threat means literally exactly. stopping the threat. Exactly. And, and a lot of times, um, you know, people get caught up on, on round counts and how many rounds are fired to. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on in your brain when we talk about decision making and then stopping that decision once you, once you tell yourself. And, uh, and, and when, you're, when you're on that trigger and you're firing, you're firing until that, that target, that threat stops. Um, and a lot of times as that threat goes down or, or you realize it stops, it takes your brain a little bit of time to realize it stops and then send a signal to this finger to stop doing this. And so there's going to be round, rounds that crank out probably faster that you didn't, you know, maybe not thought would come out. Uh, I think in mine, I ended up shooting because uh, he was blocked by some some uh, stair railing that was coming down. So some of the rounds hit the stair railing uh, until, I, until I finally got a clear shot at him uh, just before he got to my partner. Uh, I think I shot six rounds. I only remember shooting probably maybe three to four of those. I don't remember shooting the other rounds because you just kind of have a little, again, you're in that fight or flight mode. And so you're, you're, you're every, everything that's functioning in your brain is functioning back here in your hind brain, uh, not in your prefrontal cortex, which is where a lot of your short term memory is occurring and stores uh, before it puts it back here. So you're, you're going to have those little memory gaps and losses. So a lot of interesting stuff. That's a whole nother. A block of, of conversation, what goes on during a shooting uh, with the officer. It's, it's an interesting thing. So, but good question. All right, ready for this taser demonstration? So, we'll, we'll throw this in there. This is just kind of fun. Uh, there's no slide for this. Uh, so, just Going to back up just a little bit. But so we've got a. Hopefully this will come through well on the um, on the cameras for you. You want to shoot it, please? And then I'll I'll, I'll talk you through. So hopefully this is going to come through well on the camera. And you'll be able to see this. So I'm going to have Casey kind of stand to the side so you can see what we have here. This is a conductive target. So this target has is metal on the front here. So unless the probes fly all the way through, uh, which sometimes happen. Um, it may not work, but if, if they stick like they're supposed to, what you'll see for just a little bit is some is the electricity arcing uh, back and forth across the target. We've got a bag back here to kind of catch the probe so they don't go flying across the room. Um, so 
This will give you an idea just to see what one of these weapons looks like in action uh, and, and after it hits something. So Casey's going to arm it. He's going to light the sight in. And you'll hear him yell, taser, 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 and then he's going to fire. Um, it is pretty loud. So if you have you know, your 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 um, speakers way up high uh, and, you and you have sensitive ears, you might want to turn them down just a little bit. So I'll give you a second to do that. Okay, here we go. Taser, taser, taser. Okay, there we go. So you can see the he's hit. Smells good. He's hit two probes in there. One one high and one low. He's got about a foot of spread, so that would be a good good contact on a on a taser. It'd probably get us that lockup that we were looking for. Um, and these are the probes. Come out. Now, Casey's still got these connected, so if he were to turn that on right now, I'd, I'd feel quite a jolt. <laughs> so he's not going to do that. Uh, but these are the probes, and I'll kind of hold them up where you can see. I don't know if those come through very well where you can see, but they're a little, uh, about three quarters of an inch there, and then there's a little metal piece that stops them from going in any further. They're, they don't ever go in further than where that piece is, and they have a little barb that hooks to keep them in there. So uh, not a fun thing to have in you uh, from experience, but... Um, and, and definitely can be an effective tool. The wire that's connected to these is, is, a, is a copper wire. Um, they're not, they're actually pretty easy to break, uh, which is one of the things that suspects will train to do is to, when they get hit with a taser, they will roll on the ground to try and wrap themselves up in the wire and cause tension and then break it. And once that breaks, we lose connection and the, the, the weapon is no longer effective. So that is what a taser looks like and sounds like. Uh, and hopefully you guys are never on the business end of one. <laughs> this all right that is it if there, unless there's any questions i think i think we're wrapped up yep thank you questions? okay um so let me just read you some comments um thank you to you and your coworkers for putting your lives on the line to protect us you have a difficult job and unfortunately you're not appreciated or respected like you should be this training has shown me that our officers are well trained and that there's always more to the story than what is being shown in videos or in the media. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Sergeant Youngman and McKeithrin. Appreciate your time, Chief Primo and Jennifer Chu. Lots of thank yous. Um, and they're coming in so quickly that I'm having trouble reading them. Yeah, lots of thank yous and appreciation. Thank you so much. Excellent. Okay. Go in there real quick. My computer anything, so I may I may not be able to get in. Um, Your speaker. My device settings like it's so slow when I click on it. Uh, it um, let me just try. Okay. Okay, go. Speaker off. I think. Amanda, can can everybody hear me? There we go. It went finally. Can hear you, Greg. There. All right. Yeah, we can hear you, Greg. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Jason and uh, Casey, for your presentation tonight. I I know that this topic probably gives well, hopefully, it answered a lot of the questions that you might have had coming in. Um, I'm sure it did, but I know it can also kind of give you some extra questions as you maybe sit and marinate on this, whether it's later tonight or over the next course of the next week. Um, you know, one of the benefits that we have when we are able to do these academies in person is we kind of debrief the following week where people have those questions and then we kind of start the next session um, kind of going over everything. And especially when it comes to use of force, uh, some people have some interesting, uh, you know, reactions to the information and some additional questions. Um, so I, I just encourage you if, you, if you have those that come up over the course of the week, feel free to email those to, to myself or Jennifer, um, and we'll try to, to answer those as best we can over the course of the week. And some of them we might tap into Jason again to, to help clarify some stuff. But I just wanted to offer that up as well. Uh, again, as, as the course of this week happens, uh, you might have some things that pop up. Um, and again, you know, when it comes to use of force, something I think about is we, we talk about this as the green gorilla questions of, you know, it's what if this and what if that? And when it comes to use of force, there are a lot of those types of questions of, um, in this particular scenario. Um, how how would officers respond and, and everything? Um, 
but uh, yeah. I'm just going to add something, Greg, hopefully everyone can hear me, um, that we're using, this is our first platform that we've done in this way. If there's topics that you heard Sergeant Youngman talk about that you want to hear more about, that's helpful for us to know also. Yeah. So uh, I, mean, I know we ran a little bit late tonight, so I'm going to wrap this up really quick. Thanks for being here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and we will see you next week. All right. Bye, everyone. Good job, Chief. Right. OK, let's see here. This is Sergeant Youngman likes to talk. I always go over. It's hard. Because no, now mine's frozen. It's normally a three hour presentation. Yeah, yeah and that, you know, I, I, I was telling myself when we were doing this, like, dang, we should have made this class three hours, so this particular one. Well, there is so much lag on this computer. When I type, it's like 30 seconds later, it shows up. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it says, hey, Jim, um, still on says, should I mute myself and press space bar when she wants to talk? We heard many see, people are People chime and then I can't read it, you know. It's, it's certainly still a learning product. You know, yeah. Yeah. Just so you, guys, you, guys, you guys are still able to be heard on this meeting. <laughs> Jen? That's uh, six for six on the shoot in the lake question. Every time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, Jen, can you hear me? Yeah, no, that was. <laughs> and these, especially this class, I think the in person is so much better.